morning, everybody. Sorry that it's been a little late. We had a, a trouble with the live streaming. So, on behalf of North Pragas USA, I would like to welcome you all on this Saturday morning for the release of this masterpiece novel, Sundri, written by Pai Veer Singh in 1898, approximately in a, a century and a half ago. So we are very delighted to express our gratitude to all our guests who have joined us both online and in person on this momentous occasion. This event would uh, have not been possible without the support and appreciation by all the Sangat and the community members who are present here with us. This event is being organized in association with the Asian Languages Department, University of Michigan. And Professor Arvind Palmandir, has, Director of Graduate Studies, has been kind enough to foster such endeavors with us. <coughs> In the last uh, more than two decades, Nath Pragas has undertaken endeavors to conduct research in the domain of Shabd philosophy. We have regularly organized seminars, conferences, literature festivals in Amritsar Punjab since our incorporation. We have strong publishing house in Punjab and we have published more than 30 books which are in the domain of poetry, literature, critical theory and philosophy. This, there is a book exhibition which is actually going behind in this room and uh, you can, uh, uh, the members are encouraged to take a look at the different books that we have here and <clears throat> browse over those books and if you want to order some titles of interest you can, we can arrange for the delivery of the books as well. So, Nath Pragas has uh, recently launched a newspaper titled Makrang. This is available both online and on our website. We encourage young authors of diverse communities to submit their pieces that can be published on this newspaper. In many ways, the newspaper is unique, including the topics of literature, short stories, important articles of art, etc. A copy of the newspaper is also available to browse through in the book exhibition section. Extending these works across different spaces, we, in, we initiated our operations in the United States in the year 2021. This is our third years of operations in the United States and also our third book which is going to be launched in the United States. With that, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you and our guest of honor, Komal Kordangji, and who is uh, the great granddaughter of Pai Veer Singh, for being present with us on this occasion. She, accompanied by Sakpal Singh Dangji, is they have traveled all the way from Baltimore to us for the release of this book. I would like to request uh, Dr. Sarv Neelam and uh, Jaspal Kaurji to welcome the couple with a small token of our appreciation. Welcome and it's an honor for me to be here amongst all of you all and thank you for supporting Nath Prakas and hopefully we'll continue this association that we formed today. With that, I would uh, extend my thanks to Professor Puran Singh's uh, granddaughter Nilambri Ghaiji, who has joined us online and shall be expressing her thoughts in the post-lunch session. I would like to invite Komal Dangji to be on the stage for the release of this book. And I will also request Professor Arvind Pal Mandir to be on the desk with the Commandant Ji, who is Professor Jagdish Singh, who has traveled all the way from India for this release. 
Harjot Kaur, who has edited the book. So giving you a little brief background of this book. This book was originally published in, originally, uh, in Gurmukhi and uh, it was published in 1898. Since its first edition, this novel was, has created quite a storm in uh, the Sikh literary tradition. There are about 49 editions of this uh, novels, and today we are published yet another one uh, for the Sangha. And uh, however, this uh, book is quite unique in its own aspects because this is the first translation by Professor Puran Singh, which has never been published before this and it this one's uh, this publication was uh, undertaken from the 16th edition from uh, from Gurmukhi and this translation is the original translation by professor Puran Singh which never came to light until today so this is a momentous occasion in that sense too that we are uh, organizing and we are uh, releasing this book this translation uh, as uh, many unique aspects as you go through the different uh, uh, chapters you will see that the freshness of the language always is streams through the hearts and minds of the readers as they try to uh, engage with the text we get dedicate this rare document to Paiveer Singh's 150th birth anniversary celebrations which are going on this year as well with that, I would like to welcome Professor Urban Pal Singh Mandir for his keynote address to the launch of this unique classic that is being released today. Thank you for inviting me to talk here. First of all, congratulations to Nagpurgas for taking on this task of keeping the memory of Bhai Singh alive, the legacy of one of Punjab's greatest poets, and obviously the, uh, the, the key figure behind Sikh revivalism uh, in the 20th century. Uh, so this book, Sundri, and other novels of Bhai Veer Singh have played an important role in uh, the revival of Sikhi, and that role is now once again being re-examined from different perspectives. Uh, some are positive reevaluations, as we're doing here. Uh, others have been more critical, and this is the kind of reception that we have seen throughout the 20th century, late 20th century as well. So it's interesting that on the 150th anniversary, we're um, we're seeing this kind of um, convergence of very different opinions about this. So the book is uh, important. Um, uh, this particular version, the introduction, plays a very, very important role in recontextualizing this uh, uh, very important uh, version of the translation by uh, Professor Gordon Singh. And it's a major contribution to the entire effort. Now, I don't have much in the way of a keynote. Uh, what I have instead are some preliminary thoughts. Um, and uh, an effort to kind of recontextualize or just contextualize by using um, within the realm of uh, secularization. Um, this is actually part of a broader paper that I'm writing called uh, The Unsayable Word. Um, and it's, it's about the uneasy tension between uh, the reception of Gurbani and Punjabi literature, which are two completely different things. And um, I'm talking about Gurbani in terms of uh, the post-secular impulse. Now, I won't actually get to that here because of uh, the lack of time. I want to let other speakers talk about this. But uh, the work that I've been doing, interestingly, um, and re-examining this year, is part of a special issue that's being organized by uh, the journal Literature and Theology. Um, and they're doing a, um, a special issue on religion, secularism, and post-secularism in global South literatures. And of course, the Singh Sabha literature is a very important literature of the global South. Um, and these were a couple of the, um, the, 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 the points that are made by the uh, organizers of the special issue. So first of all, literature serves a vital role 
as a creative space for writers to imagine alternatives to the binary of secularism and religion, uh, negotiating the two. And then uh, Global South literary post-secularisms form a valuable contribution to scholarly work across the humanities. So this is one way in which the work uh, done, I think, by Nath Bragas and also the uh, revaluation of by Wiersling fits into this broader perspective. And what I'm going to try to do is just give you an idea of what the opposing uh, angle to by Wiersling is that's coming from secular Punjabi literature. So the past two decades have seen intense scholarly focus on secularization as a major cultural factor in political conflicts deriving from the colonial destructuring of indigenous knowledge systems uh, during India's pass uh, troubled passage into modernity. Uh, an important site where the effects of the secular destructuring can be seen clearly are in the literatures of the Indian subcontinent, notably in the formation that has come to be called modern Punjabi literature. So, um, as a way of just talking about the destructuring of indigenous knowledge systems, um, I'm using Gurbani as the example of a pre-modern uh, literature, if we can call it that, uh, and a language system that incorporates uh, elements that secularization could never quite get its head around and still has problems. Gurbani, for example, um, is underpinned by an, the non-oppositionality of its concepts and practices. In other words, you cannot fit anything into binaries, into clear binaries. It's irreducible to belief systems. And it, in that way, it becomes a real problem for classification. Um, classification for the colonizers in the late 19th century and through the 20th century, but also for this emerging, uh, what was the emerging trend in the early 20th century of uh, Punjabi <laughs> literature, or the thesis of Punjabi, um, which was pushed largely by those of a um, uh, Marxist uh, persuasion. And what this trend of literature did was to secularize the understanding of literature and language. Um, and you know, one of the key instances that we see, it's, it's one of the ways where it's really defined, is in the work of um, uh, Dr. Arthur Singh, or Professor Arthur Singh, who was a, a professor in the uh, Punjab University system. And he wrote a book called Secularization of Modern Punjabi Poetry uh, in 1988. And what that book did, I think, was encapsulate a viewpoint that had been emerging for almost 80 years prior. Um, how secularization um, and a secular consciousness effectively pushes Gurbani into a pre-modern kind of position and makes it less relevant to this world. And that's, that's the thing that I'm trying to work out in this paper. Um, Arthur Singh's whole idea is about the evolution of poetic consciousness, and this battle is being waged right now, and I think it also goes to the heart of the tension between um, Sikh, Sikh subjectivity and uh, secular subjectivity, if you like, liberal subjectivity, as, as whatever we want to call it. So let me just uh, try to read from the paper a little bit. Um, an important site where the effects of the secular destructuring can be seen is in these literatures of the Indian subcontinent, and this, especially the secularized variant that has come to be called modern Punjabi literature. Uh, it's one that emerged in the early 20th century, initially due to encounters with European rationalism, and later because of the political influence of Marxism on the literary imagination of writers in North India. Uh, modern Punjabi literature emerged from older streams of Punjabi spiritual poetry going back to the 12th century. And, reached with, and these older spiritual forms reached their zenith in the 15th and 17th centuries. In order to distinguish these older streams of spiritual poetry from the modern 20th century variants, scholars in the late modern period classified the former as pre-modern or medieval Punjabi poetry. And this is the thing that you see in uh, Arthur Singh's work, is this, uh, the way that he and scholars before him use this term medieval Punjabi poetry to designate Gurbani. Once you do that, 
um, you have basically historicized Gurbani, put it into uh, a prior age so that it has no relevance to the current moment. Mm -hmm. And it's part of a broader kind of secularization process. Um, arguably one of the most substantive literatures of pre-modern Punjabi poetry and a spiritual inspirational source for the development of secular uh, Punjabi language and literature is Gurbani itself, uh, uh, which is a body of literature compiled, edited, and canonized as Sikh scripture. Uh, for adherents of the Sikh faith, the compositions of the Sikh gurus enshrined in the scripture are not only treated as poetry in the ordinary sense, but literally as utterances of the guru, as Gurbani as utterances from the far side, suggesting that Gurbani is in some way revealed and therefore of a qualitatively different source. It comes from a very different subjective source. During the colonial era, classifying Gurbani created a problem for colonial administrators and even more so for modernist writers who brought Punjabi literature into existence in the early 20th century. For these modern writers, Many of them were Marxists. Um, the characteristics of Gurbani that I outlined earlier, non-oppositionality, irreducibility to a belief system, got in the way of providing classificatory framework. And one of the far-reaching consequences of this uh, progressive literary humanism was the disempowerment of indigenous Sikh conceptualization of language and self. Now, as I said, arguably the clearest articulation of secular theory in Punjabi literary humanism can be seen in Uttar Singh's influential book, Secularization of Modern Punjabi Poetry. And this book uh, represents not only a clear statement of Marxist theory of, of literature, and those who are uh, knowledgeable, of, even slightly knowledgeable about Punjabi literature know the influence of Marxism on the kind of Punjabi mind. Um, so I won't go into that uh, in too much. What I'd like to do is highlight three or four key moves in Uttar Singh's secularization thesis, which undermine the ontological status of Shabbat in Gurbani. By ontological, what I mean is uh, the ability of Shabbat to have uh, relevance to reality as it exists now, today, uh, to the current time, and to our to the self uh, as, as, as it exists now. So I, I highlight this uh, with the aim of projecting um, uh, the evolution of poetic consciousness in uh, Other Singh. So there's a, a three part thesis to Other Singh's work. And what he's trying to show is how poetic consciousness actually evolved into its modern uh, variant. So the main thesis uh, is summarized. Uh, in three parts. Firstly, he talks about um, religion. So whereas religion existed in India prior to the encounter with Western modernity, concepts such as the secular and secularization were clearly imported through intellectual engagement with Western philosophy and theology. To make a meaningful study, he says, of how secular principle transformed the aesthetic consciousness of Punjabi poetry, quote, it is necessary to understand the role of religion as a point of departure. And I've just underlined where I think, what I think he's getting at in his, uh, uh, the first part of his thesis. Basically, he posits religion as something that is opposite to the secular and thereby introduces the secularization thesis. Um, religion is a point of departure for him, and in a sense he's imputing religion to this uh, European concept of religion to literatures like Gurbani. He also says uh, the poetic consciousness of the medieval mystics, as he calls them, was derived from the fervor of their faith, and every medieval poet sets out to fulfill a religious need. And then uh, lastly, he says that the ideological structure of medieval Punjabi poetry of Gurbani is the idea of a personal god and a theocentric impulse. So this, is a, this becomes problematic because once you've uh, put 
the whole of Gurbani's conceptual framework into, into this very Christian sort of framework and very secular framework, uh, it's unable to actually do any real work in the real world. Um, so the second part of this, um, and he's trying to explain how did medieval Punjabi become secularized? How did the secular principle transform the sensibility of uh, medieval Indian literature, shifting its primary emphasis from theocentrism to anthropocentrism, which is ca characteristic of literary uh, humanism? Arthur Singh identifies three stages in this evolution of secular consciousness and the concomitant decline of religious sensibilities. And the first movement, he argues, emerged on the back of the so-called religious reform movements of the late 19th century, producing not only the institutionalization of uh, modern Sikhism as a religion, but equally important, a literary renaissance led by figures such as Bhai Singh. Beginning with the uh, annotated editions of theological interpretations of Sikh scripture, this activity widened considerably and helped establish a separate Sikh literary tradition and social identity by the early 20th century. As I've argued elsewhere, Bhaibir Singh's poetry and other works identified uh, the figure of the divine with veritable um, rational categories, allowing a systematic concept of God to become available for intellectual uh, discussion and polemical interreligious debates that were rife at the time. And very often, by Veer Singh's use of um, both novel and also the poetic impulse is really a pushback, it's a form of resistance against Arya Samaj ideology, which was really leading the way in polemical debates at the time. Um, so, for Uttar Singh, this is part two of his thesis. The secular consciousness involves through a progressive dissolution of religious sensibilities, and these particular movements he identifies by Veer Singh, particularly this sentence, very, very important. Um, and he's arguing that you can see this in novels such as Rana Sulat Singh, Baba Nod Singh, and also in, to some extent in Sundri as well. And he's arguing that this is where the poetic eye of Bhai Bir Singh's poetry, his idea of the subjective, achieves a subjective personality as distinguished from the eye borrowed from the traditional Sikh poetry as a symbol for the human soul. In other words, a wedge is being created in uh, the, the, the different forms of subjectivity here. The second thing he says is that the poetry of people like Puran Singh, uh, Morn Singh, Divan Singh, uh, Taniram Chatra, Kirpa Sagar, etc., attempted to expand out from a, a radical shift from the transcendental meta narratives of Bhai Veer Singh towards a more aesthetic humanism uh, that was characterized by the more spontaneous experience of nature. And he refers to texts of uh, Puran Singh, such as Kulle Madan. Kulle uh, Aswani run to make his, his, his point there. And this is actually weaves into the third, uh, part, the third thesis that he, he talks about, um, which is basically that uh, the secularization of Punjabi poetry involved aesthetic humanism as we see it in people like Puran Singh, and then uh, the influence of Indian nationalism which was a much more overtly political humanism that found two different forms of expression uh, in the literature of the Gadab movement and also in the writings later of the Kisan movement as well. I'm just going to read one quick section and then uh, just briefly conclude where I think this is going to go. The second and third stages that I just outlined here in the emergence of secular consciousness involved a significant shift according to Uttar Singh, from Bhaibir Singh's transcendental meta-narratives towards aesthetic uh, experience characterized by more spontaneous and sensuous experience of nature. Eschewing uh, Bhaibir Singh's quest for certainty of the real vis-a-vis -vis proofs for the existence of God, Puran Singh explores uh, aesthetically grounded forms of mysticism in poetry 
poems such as Kulli Madan, which means open domains. In Other Sin's reading, Kulli Madan discovers an ambivalence within human subjectivity, which is then ascribed to man's inability to perceive a self-evident God. So in other words, he's reading Puran Singh as undergoing some sort of a secular crisis and uh, is projecting that onto the entire sort of literature of, of, of Puran Singh. And he argues that this failure of uh, human perception points to a different psychological disposition featuring a self-conscious individualism whose sense of wonder or vismad grows weaker and weaker. In other words, what he's ascribing to Guran Singh, to uh, Bhaibir Singh, is a disenchantment thesis. The idea of, you know, that we're living in a kind of disenchanted world and that they're clearly experiencing this. However, against other things secular reading, a different psychological disposition discerned by Guran Singh does not involve a reason versus faith binary, but rather a fluid, mystical synthesizing of immanence and transcendence, resulting in a more nuanced model of the self as in what he calls an open domain, a kulamada, um, in which difference comes to be associated into a unity. And this is what the entire secular movement has completely sort of missed out. They just could not get their heads around what mystical poets were doing, what literatures like Gurbani were doing, which is basically synthesizing differences rather than creating necessarily uh, unities. So against other thing or contra other thing, it is not an internally separated individualism which perceives the world through oppositional logic. Indeed, it's quite the reverse. It is an expression that we see in both Puran Singh and Bhaibir Singh of a fluid in between, one might even say diasporic kind of subjectivity um, that was also very similar to Puran Singh's lived experience. In short, a more helpful way to think about Puran Singh's work, and this is relevant because Puran Singh is commenting on uh, and translating uh, Bhaibir Singh's work, especially the Sundari that we're, we're looking at. Uh, a more helpful way to think about it is to see it as a bridge between the theocentric religion-making that Arthur Singh talks about and the more explicitly secularizing tendencies of the third wave in the evolution of modern Punjabi poetry. In other words, the uh, poets like Guran Singh and Bhaibir Singh had already done what the secular Marxists were trying to do in their work, which is kind of work across differences. Now this third wave is the secularization proper of Punjabi poetry which took shape in the 1930s and this is what uh, Arthur Singh calls the evolution of poetic consciousness the way he sees it. And it coincides with the political rise of communism in India accompanied by a proliferation of Marxist re-readings of what they call medieval Punjabi poetry. Unlike their predecessors and contemporaries, these poets and novelists were vehemently anti-colonial, anti-religious, and also part of a secular Indian nationalism which espoused a literary humanism along Western lines, even as they, as they opposed the West politically. These early forms of anti-colonial Punjabi literature found expression, as I said earlier, in the Pardesi movement of Gadars, and the more desi expressions of Punjabi nationalism we see in the writings of the communist Kisan movement. And to this day, we have this kind of separation of uh, literatures um, uh, between those who hold kind of the, the Marxist position and those who hold the, uh, uh, the Sikh position. At the heart of Uttar Singh's secularization thesis is the idea that modern Punjabi poetry rests or is able to wrest sovereignty away from the religious bedrock of what they call theocentric medieval thought, and that's, that's being directly quoted, which constrains genres such as Gurbani and then reinvests it in a more humanistic consciousness, which now exerts and displays its own epistemic sovereignty over language uh, as we see in the worldliness of modern Punjabi literature. What I'm arguing here, and I won't give you the rest of the paper because it'll take too long, 
What I do in the next half of the paper is to show explicitly how a different logic applies to, um, to the concepts of Gurbani, which uh, Bhairi Singh is wrestling with, Puran Singh and all these other poets are wrestling with. Um, and that, um, that is where the sovereignty of this particular logic uh, lies. And I'm doing that in, in the second part of the paper, specifically through the concept of Anhad Shabad, Anhad Nad. And um, hopefully we'll do a, a second part to this uh, in, in sometime in January, which I, I've actually done this in detail in my new little book called Philosophical Reflections on Shabad. And it's a way of basically showing how both the McLeod School, uh, which has been influential in the West, and then Marxist, uh, secular literature are performing exactly the same procedure in constraining the the sovereign aspect of concepts of good money. Um, and I'm just going to share with you this map, which summarizes what I've been trying to say. So, what what he's done, what uh, people like other Singh have done, is taken good money, repackaged it, and marginalized it through this concept of medieval Punjabi poetry, which becomes a kind of a construct for them on, upon which to build their own thesis about secularization. And the idea is that once you have categorized it as medieval Punjabi poetry, you can then destructure indigenous knowledge systems and move beyond them to the modern knowledge system. Uh, so the what we understand as Gurbani and the Marxists understand as medieval Punjabi poetry undergoes both a religionization in the hands of the Singh Sabha and a secularization in the hands of Marxists. Now it's interesting they're both working with the same kind of literature. Um, both of them recognize Punjabi as their mother tongue, but their responses are completely different and they lead eventually to two very different um, political structures in Punjab, and political movements in Punjab. Um, one centered around modern Sikhism, and the other centered around Punjabi culture, which today becomes the whole thesis of Punjabi. So when people say, you know, um, leave Sikhi, uh, think more about Punjabi, this is where it's kind of coming from. But what they're trying to do is to show that Gurbani and its concepts are essentially regressive, that they don't have place in the, in the modern world. Um, and, and so that, if this, if this was about the restructuring of knowledge that Adar Singh is doing, it actually corresponds to a similar restructuring of subjectivity. So in a sense, um, uh, this is also Adar Singh's argument that religious poetic consciousness the theocentric impulse gives way to a secular poetic consciousness. Um, bondage to a personal God gives way to autonomy. And so they claim all of the stuff that the secular European uh, rational enlightenment has um, kind of bequeathed to them. And it's a way of delegitimizing subjectivity that comes out of the sick impulse, uh, the impulse of Gurbani. So once that's delegitimized, the, the truth kind of subjectivity is the one that is able to use humanistic principles. And I think I want to finish there. And in, in the actual paper, I go in much deeper into concepts such as Shabd, um, Anhad Nad, etc. But this should, I think, set the context a little bit for um, our other speakers. So hopefully, uh, I haven't taken too much time. This was a very enlightening uh, and profound thesis. Thank you, Dr. Mandir, for uh, introducing us to the structural <coughs> principles of secularization, how the secular modes of understanding the Sikh literature has been influential in the modern consciousness and especially in the more secularized political domains of uh, our age. <clears throat> With that, um, I would uh, uh, 
also appreciate Dr. Mandir's work for uh, giving us the apparatus to actually articulate a native voice uh, for uh, for for uh, bringing up the new texts, including like that of Sundri in a purely decolonized world of today. So we are moving towards that with the uh, with more and more engagement in our native spirits. Moving on, <clears throat> it becomes clear from the introduction of this book, uh, Sundri, that there are two ways actually to approach the content of a text. Uh, first is the life content or the life form of the text, which uh, while the second one is more ideological content or the ideological frameworks in which the text gets defined and uh, how the worldview gets constructed. Dr. Mandir has actually uh, uh, given us more light to look at how, uh, how the worldview is being secularized and it has uh, given us a more, uh, a more constricted view of looking at the, our own native text. So thank you very much for that as well. So, so a critical evaluation is not simply an, uh, an influence under the dominant in that, uh, ideological narratives of an age. It's, it is basically, uh, it's not a, it is more of an ideological establishment as well. So it is also an ideological manipulation of the same uh, of our perspectives. So it is quite an uh, acceptable view that the ideological struggle imparts meaning to the literary texts. So we have tried to introduce that in the introduction of this book as well. With that, I would like to invite Harjot Kaur, who is the editor and has authored the introduction of this edition to the dais and uh, present her views on Sundri. And uh, I must mention that this introduction is also published online on the website of Sikh Formations. And we encourage our audience to visit and download a copy for uh, if it, it is available uh, without any charge on the website of Sikh Formations. So, uh, once again, Pajot Kaur. Respected Chief Guest, Koma Kaur Dangji, respected members of the audience and friends. I'm honored to be here. Pailir Singh composed Sundari in the Gurmukhi language in 1898. And this work was translated by Professor Purun Singh into English in 1924. And today marks a momentous occasion of the release of the English translation which was written by Professor Purun Singh. It's a momentous moment as well as it's a greatly nostalgic moment for me. Both Pailir Singh, whom I will call Parisar interchangeably, and Professor Puran Singh, they stand as the literary geniuses of the Sikh literary tradition. The first novel that came out in the Sikh literary tradition was actually none other than Sundri. Both these men, they enunciated the Sikh engagement with immanent and transcendent through various forms of literature, such as novel, poetry, biographies, essays, etc. Professor Puran Singh, in the journey of the unfolding of his spiritual consciousness, took a multifold path through Vedanta, through Buddhism. And it culminated in the discipleship of the Shabad Guru and the spiritual mentoring touch of Vaidhir Singh. Professor Puran Singh also attributes his receiving of poetry, the dawning of his poetry by the very grace of Fahir Singh. Professor Singh says, quote, I received poetry and it was by the favor of that kindly eye. His dulcet prophetic words touched automatically the souls of my own Punjabi vocabulary, unquote. Professor Poon Singh translated many of the works of Pailir Singh, one of which was Sundari, and those familiar with both uh, Paisal's and Professor Singh's diction of experiencing can perhaps discern some common undercurrents in the idioms of these two personalities. The Sundari translation into English that Professor Poon Singh undertook due to a close association between him and Paisal 
naturally cognizes and intrinsically carries Paisab's undertones and the essence, which with Paisab wrote Sundari. Uh, Amadeep and I undertook an effort to introduce the English translation of Sundari, and this effort was both a privilege as well as a responsibility. It was a prerogative because we were honored to bring forth a work of epic significance into the English-speaking world. It was a responsibility at the same time because this work carried a part of the very selves of two of our traditions, pioneering literary geniuses. And so it silently demanded us to invest due diligence and panoptism in comprehending the true nature of their work before we introduced the text. By using and Professor Pulisic both wrote their respective prefaces for the original Gurmukhi version and the English translated version respectively. And in the prefaces, they state the motivation, direction, purpose, and goal of the novel. Through our readings of the novel and, their pre pre and reading their prefaces, we formulated an understanding of the work. However, as we reviewed the various commentaries and critical analyses that prevailed around the text, we felt that the spirit of the text was not necessarily reflected and accounted for in that exegesis. As we were working on delineating the introduction of this work, which was translated around 100 years ago, it was paramount for us to ensure that the introduction we construct, it aptly treats the critique as well as the reactions to sundry. We wanted to ensure from our side to provide to our readers an unbiased lens through which perhaps they could consider perceiving sundry. And all the while we were watchful about the dictate that the direction and the vision that the author and the translator have provided in the prefaces does not get lost, does not get sidelined. In doing so, we strive to organize and categorize the narratives that have emanated around the text. We have attempted to critically evaluate and challenge, where needed, the popular scholarly lore around the text, as well as we have tried to excavate what has been said, not said about the text, rather. Before I go further, let me uh, preface by saying that the introduction we compose is rather elaborate and very expansive. And due to the periphery of the assigned time today, I'm going to present, a, I'm going to shine a broad light on overall introduction of the work. Um, I'll cover briefly some aspects such as the macro environment in which somebody was written, the, uh, a very brief biography of Pai Veer Singh. Uh, by Singh's conceptual framework, which was centered around his perception of history and truth, the tone of prevalent narratives around Sundari, what Sundari means to us as na native practitioners of Sikh tradition, and last but not the least, are the epistemological inquiries that we've raised and contributed to at the same time through the course of this introduction. Our first interest at that time, when we started writing the introduction to Sundari, was to understand the set of circumstances that led to Paisab's writing of Sundari. The macro environment in and around the Sikh society at the time that Sundari was written was such that on the one end, there were feudalized cultural practices that had been prevalent for, that had been prevalent for more than a century and a half. And these practices, were quite contrary to the teachings of the Guru and a crescentary at several times. And on the other end, we had the colonial onslaught. The colonial onslaught had caused subjugation of native subjectivity as social, educational, cultural models of the colonizer had become rampant. So the spirit with which the Sikhs had come to relate with their tradition since the Guru period it had started to side, being sidelined and being suppressed owing to such macro environment. And it was in these tempestuous times that Pai Veer Singh took on his pen to excavate the Sikh spirit. And he did so by composing a compendium of rich literature. The Sixth River of Punjab gave us a panoramic view of the Sikh spirit. Sundari was the first novel that was composed under this effort. And then later on, there were several others followed that, that way. Vijay Singh, Sakwant Kaur, Rana Surat Singh, etc. Next, I want to give you a very brief account of Paideer Singh's biography. Uh, Komal Kaur Dangji is with us today. Uh, she, has, she will provide a much more detailed account of Paideer Singh's biography. But just to uh, shine a little light on, on, uh, on his backdrop, 
Um, Paisa had inherited a rich scholarly heritage from both sides of his family. Paivir Singh's grandfather, Baba Khan Singh, was the first to get initiated to the Sikh faith, and he was he spent his youth in learning traditional Punjabi language, scriptures, and, and, and languages. By uh, Paisa's father, Dr. Charan Singh, who was a very renowned poet, musician, lexicographer, um, and a leader of the Sikh community. Uh, from his maternal side, uh, his mother, uh, Subhadra Kaur's father, Gyani Hazara Singh, was a renowned scholar of Persian and Sanskrit, and he translated many of those works into Punjabi. Um, the prevalence of such heritage clearly, firmly anchored by some in the tenets of Sikh tradition. He blossomed as a multifaceted literator, a pioneer who penned an array of works across various genres, such as novel and poetry, that contributed in that macro environment to reviving the six spirits, as Professor Madeir was mentioning. Now, the macro environment or the historical conditions in which Paivir Singh wrote Sundari, coupled with his biographical accounts, impart the understanding that the nature of truth is never singular in its scope and expanse. There is never a singular truth that exists in a time. The time is a multi-layered device through which consciousness folds. And there are multiple layers in which the truth of an age becomes available. We have tried to engage with the multiple levels of layers of prevalent truth, corner truth, etc. Some of the terms we define about in, in the introduction that we've given. The, the, these formulations reflect the notion that uh, some of the some of the you know the notions that we believe Pai Veer Singh had um, around history uh, and around linear time. Um, we, we extract these uh, conceptions of Pai Veer Singh from readings of his oeuvre, uh, not just Sundari, but we read several other texts, uh, one of which was uh, notably the Sri Guru Prapa, Surish Prapa Shkran, for which he inscribed the introduction. And in there he mentions that uh, he mentions his views about history being a multi-layered expanse. Uh, and he says, he gives a vivid account of his thesis on history and historicism and observes that in the approach of history writing, regardless of the style of history, regardless of the type of hagiography, be it summarized, which is Saran's way of writing history, or Savistari uh, Komal Unri, which is the descriptive fine art of writing history, or Savistarik Vigyanik, which is the descriptive scientific way of writing history, there are all these three undercurrents that are present in the hagiography. They are literary, uh, narrative, spiritual. They are present to one, some extent or the other in all forms of history writing. And Paisa um, talks about spiritual undercurrent, the third spiritual undercurrent in this way, that in the third spiritual undercurrent, quote, History presents glimpses of everlasting eternal spiritual principles. Despite being descriptively documented in world's history, a principle that can be culled from historical writing would contain the spiritual essence. And in purview of its third undercurrent, that is the spiritual undercurrent, history cannot remain detached from shared experiences entrenched in humanity's history. And, unquote, by virtue of this comment that by Veer saying wrote, verbatim, we infer that via reference to events of history in Sundri and his other works, Paisab's interest was in encouraging the discovery of the underlying principles that can be culled from the events in Sundri to reflect a meaning within their occurrence. In addition, universal meanings lend to be drawn from the works such as Sundri since it was especially replete with spiritual undercurrents. Second of note that I would like to mention is that Paivir Singh did not uh, consider history as a source of pure esteem. Uh, in the same introduction, he mentions, quote, we cannot accept the argument put forward by some who consider history as an embodiment of pure esteem. History is some faction of knowledge. One may call it a knowledgeable faction or knowledge abound faction. But history is not the pure pristine. To express his position from Sikh context regarding the fountainhead of pure pristine, Paisa notes, quote, in Sikh context, 
history holds a status lower than Gurbani, Guru Sattva, and Guru Sukha. So one of the cautions that we infer from his views is that by employing history in critical theory, in philosophy, in religious um, studies, inadvertently is history catapulted to a master subject. And when this master subject gets armed with subjective reasoning, it enables to, it gets enabled to assume an ideological value greater than other sources of history. There are other excavations of his conceptual formulations that um, that do come out from the readings of this oeuvre. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll uh, presently uh, mention uh, as the last part of my talk of this section that uh, Paisab's conceptions of truth and its durable nature find a shared view, find a trace of uh, shared views in, in the concepts of other scholars too. One such scholar of the modern world being Hans George Gadamer. We expound on Gadamer's and others' views in our introduction to somebody. Uh, let me presently draw now your attention to uh, the prevalent narratives around Sunni. Uh, there are several narratives. Um, on one particular one, I'll offer a detailed comment. There is a scholarly uh, reading that we came across that harbors the view that Sindri is an object of historical fiction. And the scholar says, quote, in BDS's case, by Beersing's case, his novels cultivated an imaginative space for the playing out of history. History is a part, pa past, I'm sorry, that feeds the present. And the historical consciousness his novels deployed drew in complex ways of sick precedence within also a colonial frame. Through his novels, he blurred the line between historical fact and creative fiction, fiction to find a springboard for a desired sick future, unquote. Although scholars might agree with this position, we see that there is a fine line that prevents us, our interpretation, from inferring Sundari as a pure subject of either history or fiction, or to say specifically linear history, pure fiction. To enunciate this, first, this fine line, let me first expound on the genesis and turf of fiction. Fiction operates within the psychology of characters. And it unveils a form of representation of truth, a desired truth. Fiction uses the techniques and underpinnings of psychology and subjectivity to construct the narration of desired truth that operates within the forces of psychological tensions, psychological cravings, so as to speak. And as we know, that human psychology, it gets replete in many <coughs> counterbalances and balances across the day, across the time. And there is produced and within the psychology of human mind several dualities and antagonisms and individual temperaments. And, and this often gives rise to a monologue within the psychology where the self is seeking a, a world of dreams, aspirations, fights, etc. In either case, the content of fiction is drawn from social or individual psychology. However, this truth does not operate in plane beyond the self-psychology or the society psychology. That is, it does not operate in the meta-plane. Sundri is a work that is anchored in the constructs of meta-planes of Sadda and Saki, dimensions of eternal truth. So, in our perspective, it does defy being the work of pure fiction. Similarly, we are debtored in viewing Sundri as a, a strict subject of linear history. To us, the idea of linear history when applied to Sundri makes the text unintelligible. Because the idea of Sundri being a, a work of, of linear history, it foregrounds history as a signifier. That itself, it remains out of the subject as it becomes a representation of the past that influences the present. Whereas Sundri is a living moment at every nodal point in the novel. There is not a phantom of an idea that she's pursuing. At every point in time, she's living by being one, and by one being fluid in the cosmos, not just her internal cosmos, but the external aspect of the cosmos too. So there's not a phantom idea that she's pursuing, you know, as, as history uh, essentially denotes several times. Uh, there are other perspectives, there are other prevalent narratives around something that we've come across. They've centered around being 
uh, making Sundari as either a, a, a topic of Punjab studies, meaning approaching Sundari as a Punjabi subject with a certain ethnicity, with a certain silo of her belonging to a geographic region and the language, etc. Um, there is also a perspective of she being a gendered subject from the lens of feminism. From the lens of post-colonialism, she has been approached as a mechanism of promulgating and establishing six identities. Um, and then there is also some promulgation of uh, the relation that Sundri has with secular and post-modern world. And we have commented on these narratives um, in, the, in the work, in the introduction work that we have um, crafted. So, with the, we recognize that, you know, with the prevalent views, these prevalent views that exist on Sundari, the discourse on Sundari has certainly moved forward. There's absolutely no contention about that. Um, and, and, and the discourse on Sundari, because of this, continues to remain alive. Uh, we do consider them, these narratives, to be in a certain way of being of appropriative nature. They have played an appropriating role such that we believe they've tampered with the Sundri's being by planting a hermeneutic of suspicion in the reader's mind, while themselves failing to engage with the text from the vantage point of hermeneutics of faith. So there is a predisposition towards hermeneutic of suspicion that, that, that we thought could commonly prevail across the narratives that were uh, expanded on Sundri. We also believe that there was some sort of imposition of preset lenses to offer the crutch of a lazy and ignorant engagement with the text to the reader. Um, and it did trigger the postulation in our minds as introducers of the translated work that there is perhaps an intentional project at play behind the scenes. That perhaps there is that that project behind the scenes is, is it's willfully avoiding to grasp the universality of Sunday. It's, really, it's willfully, you know, uh, avoiding capturing the spiritual context of the text as is laden in the text all over. During the next part of my talk, I want to briefly talk about our interest, which was to excavate Sundari or the Aziz of Sundari. Um, our native lens foresaw the need to, the opportunity to recenter Sundari's being from being a decentered position that the prevalent views had imposed on her being. And so to do so, we first and foremost delved into multiple reviews of the text. We read by Veer Singh's Gurmukhi version a few times. We read, um, the, of course, the translation that Professor Poulin Singh had written a few times. And we reviewed the prefaces that both the author and the translator had uh, given. And uh, this, this, this definitely acquired, this definitely paved the way for us to acquire a first-hand experience of the text a very native, a very original experience of the text. And secondly, we peruse the works of several scholars to help us refine our own critical thinking and shape the spectrum of our exploration. Of particular significance that I'll call out uh, is that our thesis uh, to, to resurrect Sundari's as is being uh, was, was guided uh, from Martin, Martin Heidegger's exploration of the question of being. So how do we construct our narrative about Sundri? Let me delve into this next. We delve into Sundri from the perspective of being in the world, from her, be a, from her being a being in the world. That is, we try to decipher her essence from how she engaged with her inner world and the outer world. Throughout the text, we saw her engaging with empathy, respect, and a caring demeanor, irrespective of the creed of the individuals she came across. We witnessed her experiencing a sense of belongingness in the world. It did not matter to her if the wound on the battle was a person of her own belief system or it was, or the person was from some other belief system. It just did not mention, really matter to her. Her silence appears to resonate with that silence that the scholar Luce Irigere comments as in an internalization of divinity, an essential for transforming oneself into a higher being, unquote. Her silence is not a remark of subjugation, as some of the interpretations have thought her to be. Um, one of my favorite scenes in the Sundri text is where she's sitting next to a serene pawn while evading capture by the ruling forces. I'll take a very brief moment to narrate that scene to you. Um, 
so she's sitting quite she's sitting right next to a pond and she's evading capture and the scene says the senses are suspended to sense the beautiful to hear the unheard touch the ineffable to smell him who hath no scent scent there she sat silent but inwardly singing glory glory to him with her eyes closed but seeing almost a sculptured figure of the buddha in dhyana and round her flew about unafraid the waterfalls dropping leaf by curls from the flapping wings and the little birds came and perched on her shoulders curious to know if a swarm of heaven had come down to them and perhaps they saw the luminous wings of light spreading from her shoulder right up to the sky so this scene is deeply reminiscent of the harmony that sundari is bearing in and around her world and it's positing her as a continuum of existence in the temporal world as well as is extending her presence into the transcendent world it appears to be a dialogue between the immanent and the transcendent in her own unique way the text often um, bespeaks her as being in unison with the remembrance and meditation of the guru it presents her courage as an outward manifestation of her inward mental and spirit which she dynamically brings forth on various occasions during the plot incidentally we did not see any recognition or any commentaries that came our way that recognize her being in the world in the manner that was in, in unison that was recognizing her being in the immanent and the transcendent to further access sundri's being we attempt to engage with her through semiotics of sakhi name sakhi name for a for a, for a uh, brief translation could be termed as uh, the divine act in temporal form sakhi name is a bestowed form of living that is transparently hinged to that form of living through which the physical form of guru body engages in temporality through sakhi name the guru body maintains an incessant interplay with matter time space around where all occurrences and incidents that the guru body deals with they get emancipated and coded into a meta epistemology and it's through sakhi name that humanity gets poised to <coughs> decode this meta epistemology and this decodification is new is fresh is fluid in time and space we attempt to retrieve uh, the essence of sundri through through one such decodification attempt of sakhi name and under this attempt we see her being as constitutive of reflections from three principalities first principality being of saraswati saraswati was the name of sundri before she got folded into the sikh uh, tradition the name saraswati suggests the representation of the primeval spirit of pure folk culture of punjab with punjab not reflecting a geographical area here or certain set of geocoordinates rather punjab is an abode whose people exemplify simplicity and intimate engagement with nature and life while they sought the beyond to bear on their temporal living so that that purity of folk spirit in saraswati is one of the principalities that we're using is one of the employees or decodifications uh, techniques to ex- excavate herself the second principality that we we leverage is the dasam granth Now the Dasam Granth is a text which sings the engagement of the energy of the cosmic forces with the existence present in the form of temporal <coughs> living and reverse engagement of the temporal living with the transcendent. This is why the Dasam Granth stands as the granth of the Kal dimension of the Kal Purak, because in time there is a dialogue. there is an interface an interaction that's going on between the cosmic forces and the forces that are in the temporal world there is a response reaction mechanism there is a calling there is a response between those forces of energy so and and, and we all know it's a dasam granth is a composition rendered by none other than the guru body and it it was it was rendered by the guru body in its state of dawning in time engaging with the cosmic forces and serving a dynamic model of creative expanse through the highest <coughs> art of living that the very state of temporality can showcase to the transcendent 
So in many ways, uh, Sundri's engagement as a warrior, in time, via her outward actions and inward living, is reminiscent of the dynamic model of temporality that Dasamran enunciates via the goddess Shakti paradigm. And the third principality uh, that we draw upon is that of Mata Sahib Deva. Mata Sahib Deva represents the manifestation of the cosmic motherhood principle of the Khalsa. Through Sakhi names, transpiration during the time space expands of the establishment of Khalsa's order, unveils pointers to her being the epicenter of cosmic discipline, which renders as Mariyata in temporality. As the mother of the Khalsa, she carries and nurtures the spirit of Khalsa with the essence of Mariyata. The spirit of service, the act of nurture, the healings that Sundari spreads around her reflect this Mariyata. We are the cosmic mother in the dimension of her being. So this was a, a semiotic reclamation of Sundari's being. In the penultimate step of my talk, let me hone in on the, the epistemological inquiries and perspectives that we've raised in the introduction. And we hope that the readers, via their engagement with this text, will help to further the knowledge construction around Sunday. Some of the questions and perspectives that we raise, and we provide our own uh, inputs to these questions, is the first question is, is there an alternative approach to otherization that allows access to the spirit of a work such as Sunday? We believe that anupavi dupakta, or simultaneous experiencing of dualness, that is of self and the non-self, is one such approach. The realm of anupavi dupakta enables one to simultaneously experience what may appear to be polar opposites in the first glance. Particularity, universality. Are they really polar opposites, or can one experience them at the same time, in simultaneity? That's a question that we've raised and we've attempted to give our inputs to that. And there are other perceived dualities of vakkarapan, nyarapan, being the source of identity. Is, is vakkarapan the, the only source of identity? Or can nyarapan be an inclusive source of the identity? How do we perceive sundri? Then maybe perhaps becomes a personal question. Theocentrism, secularism, etc. are they are they polar opposites, or maybe they can also be experienced via Anupavita Bhakta? That's the first question that we raise, we talk about. Um, the other question that we raise and provide our perspective is, well, must feminism necessitate the spectral presence of the masculine other to imagine itself? Or can feminism imagine itself from its being? In other words, must the spectrum of the masculine other be present? to lend a definition to feminism? Or can feminism stem from the inner recesses, the inner being of female experience? We broach this question on a scholarly level with particular insights from Heidegger's, Heidegger's <laughs> works and of works of several others, and we build on them. Um, we noted that there are some radically obtuse recriminations that a particular Western Sikh scholar makes on Pahir Singh. And the scholar doesn't stop at Pahir Singh. The scholar continues to incisively pose those recriminations to the Sikh reformers, activists, grumpy Sikh society, institutions, and even Sikh gurus. And there's a positing, a positing an open inquiry, whether such questioning, we posit this open inquiry, whether such questioning under the covers secretly aspires to introduce a new subjectivity and consciousness of the scholar's readers, in a way, perhaps introducing a form of neocolonialism and perhaps desiring for leading to an exclusion of a culture, a whole civilization, from a meaningful engagement with the scholar's native space. Is this perhaps an intentional project? That's a question that we raise. We offer comments and we seek further inputs. And there are, of course, other you know, areas of inquiry that we raise and we offer our, perspective, offer our perspectives in, in the introduction. Coming to uh, the, the end of my talk, in, in the closure stage, I'd like to close my talk by urging all of you to, to read Sundari, by to engage with the text Sundari, and draw a meaning of Sundari's being from your native experience. And I will say that 
there are rare occasions when Sikh traditional texts are introduced with fresh in translations. And the rare, there are rarer still those occasions when a spiritual mentor and a spiritual mentee representing the helms of the literary tradition are engaged in experiencing a work, in documenting a work. We are on that occasion of, we are on the cusp of that occasion in meta history when that has just happened. Here is a text that was written by a spiritual mentor, translated by his spiritual mentee using the same idiomatic undercurrents or, or proximity of the same idiomatic undercurrents. So it's a wonderful opportunity that we have. So let's take, let's partake the gift of love of the forefathers um, that our tradition, uh, that, that was left for us in our tradition a century ago. I'm honored to be a part of today's historic event and I'm beyond thankful to have shared it with Faivir Singhs and Professor Poolin Singhs family members, the presiding pers personnel and all of you. Thank you, Hachutpa, for this uh, wonderful talk and uh, great introduction. We have a short break right now, and uh, we'll be taking like 10 minutes quick break for a snack and coffee break, and uh, we'll resume after that for our next part. So we have two main speakers for session two. Uh, Dr. Pravinder Mehta, uh, followed by uh, Dr. Harleen Kaur. Um, I'd like to invite Dr. Mehta to the stage. Uh, she's a, a scholar of literature with a PhD in, in English literature, and she writes widely on, on topics uh, including aesthetics, uh, affect theory, um, and today she's going to talk about subjectivity in her talk. So, Dr. Mehta. Thank you for this opportunity to share, for me to share my views here today. Congratulations to the wonderful team of Nath Raghav for this release of this beautiful book today. Uh, the novel, the first novel in Punjabi literature, published in 1898, and its book released in a brand, brand new edition by the G. Park, reveals the complexities and nuances uh, through a, uh, of the discourse of six subjectivity that I plan to talk about today. Frankly, I'm surprised that it has taken me so long to delve into Punjabi literature, seeing that I'm a literary scholar working at the intersections of literary and cultural criticism. In teaching as well as research, my work applies cross-comparative approaches to literature drawing from philosophy as well as cultural studies and other uh, disciplines. In my world literature courses, here I introduce uh, to undergraduate students uh, the vast contributions of the non-Western writers. One thing that I emphasize early on in the beginning of the semester to my students is this. While working in Western Academy, one may easily get swayed by Western ideas, concepts, and ideologies. Still, as scholars of cultural studies, our perspectives uh, on non-Western literature must acknowledge the non-Western frameworks that come to shape those texts and contexts, just as when we understand Western literary texts, we are encouraged to also understand Western frameworks and social meanings. So a gap comes in when we shift to non-Western literature, yet understand it's from within Western frameworks. Surely some students will resist non-Western ideas, concepts, and even ideologies because of cultural conditioning, but for the most part, they recognize the idea of cultural difference. My central question here is, is there a politics to power and likewise a power to the politics of representing or even regulating Sikh identity vis-a-vis -vis Sikh uh, interpretation? My larger project is to examine how Sikh subjectivity is framed, represented, and inter interpreted. At times when six subjects, both male and female, are offered tangible representations, their representations may be interpreted as an ethnicity on margin, struggling with identity conflicts, and seemingly burdened by history. The word subjectivity, in simple terms, means a sense of self, 
and yet is also encoded with power relations and dynamics. To be a subject and to be subjected to imply different set of meanings suggest a power dynamic within critique that needs to be investigated and theorized. Subjectivity is then not just an individual sense of identity, it is a sense of self influenced by social forces, a sense of self that is ascribed with empowerment and agency rather than otherness and estrangement. Can we then know the interior uh, experience of the sick, or is his or her identity always curtailed by either power structures drawn from historical repressions or violent experiences? Are six unknown, unfathomable, fathomable, unrepresentable entities, or at best an ethnicity on margins? Are six framed and interpreted as dehumanized, incomprehensible others? Like the strange non-Western subject in Western literature, the Sikh subject also faces ethno-social discrepancies between desire, curiosity, abjecthood, and gaze. The politics of representation, more so in the context of representing Sikhs for the non-Sikh audiences, for example, really what uh, uh, reveals uh, what French philosopher Michel Foucault explains as strategic discursive practices to produce a certain kind of subject constituted through regulated knowledge that delineates the effects of mainstream power. So the sixth subject is also subjected to a particular kind of knowledge, uh, a particular kind of episteme. Who says what about the six and under what conditions is controlled by a discursive practice that, and I quote from Foucault, controls the dissemination of certain knowledge thereby ensuring the domination of certain social interests by producing a certain kind of subject. So coming to uh, understand the great literary legacy of Hai Singh, we all know that his corpus of literary production is remarkable. A poet, a philosopher, a, a playwright, a novelist, a biographer, and a translator. His contribution as a Sikh Sabari former are evident in his writings, creative as well as critical. So before we understand the cultural context of a novel like Sundari, it is important to understand how the Singh Sabha reform movement came. The challenges posed by Western culture as well as the spread of Christianity initiated a series of reform movements within Indian religions. The Arya Samaj fundamentalism in Hinduism and Ahmadiyya heresy in Islam. As Professor Harban Singh notes in his book, uh, Bhai Veer Singh, uh, challenged by the religious and cultural forces around it, Sikhism was set on a course of understanding. In the May 25, 1894, uh, note published in Khalsa Akbar, the mood of Singh Sabha movement is apparent. And I want to read this quote. Just as we do not see any Buddhist in the country except in images, in the same fashion, the Sikhs who are now here and there visible in their turbans and their other religious forms, like steel bracelets and swords, will be seen only in the pictures in museums. Their own sons and grandsons turning Christians and clad in coats and trousers and sporting mushroom-like caps will go to see them in the museums and say in their pidgin Punjabi, Look, that is a picture of a Sikh, the tribe that inhabited this country once upon a time. Efforts of those who wish to resist the onslaughts of Christianity are feeble and will prove about abortive like a leper without hands and feet trying to save a boy falling off a rooftop. This is cited in Professor Harbhan Singh's book. Professor Harbhan Singh's book explains well the early influences on Bhai Veer Singh's life, including his grandfathers, Bhai Khan Singh and Gyani Hazara Singh, and his father, Dr. Charan Singh, who all provided an environment of deep interest in literary and scriptural studies. Raised on the stories of Sikh bravery and sacrifices from the 18th century, Bhai Veer Singh's interest in the Singh Sabha movement are reflected in the glorification of Sikh history in his work. His work on promoting Sikh ideals by, the found, by founding the Khalsa Tract Society and publishing pamphlets on various topics of relevance to Sikh faith allowed him to explore critical sensibilities, 
from six perspectives. Punjabi prose writing flourished, obviously, and helped Punjabi leadership and literacy. Likewise, his role in launching a VT newspaper on the Khalsar Samachar is noted as a catalyst for Punjabi journalism. He reminds me of Samuel Johnson of 18th century British writer who equally uh, produced uh, so much of prose and essay, changed the genre of prose writing. Being an avid reader by Veer Singh, also, who studied in a Christian missionary school, was familiar with historical fiction of Sir Walter Scott and novels like Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress, Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, and Samuel Johnson's The <coughs> Sellers. Published in 1898, uh, so Sundri is a novel uh, about a young, newly uh, married Hindu woman named Surasti slash Saraswati, in different editions, uh, the name is a bit modified. Awaiting to join her uh, in-laws soon, she is celebrating her Maklava in her maiden home. So I, for sake of understanding, I want to go through the summary a little bit and then go to critical uh, connections. However, she is kidnapped by a Mughal Nawab who picks her up and carries her away. The family and some villagers visit the Mughal Nawab and plead him to release Saraswati as she is a married woman, but the Nawab refuses. So then further on, she initially says, I will die in the living red fire, I will kindle that ancient holy flame. Saraswati's brother, Balwan Singh, had become an Amritthari Khalsa, and so he realizes that his sister has been kidnapped. So a brother's mission to rescue his sister, he rescues her as she is getting ready to immolate herself while reciting the Japji Sahib. The Hindu parents lament and even uh, curse Palwam Singh for aggravating their agony by bringing Saraswati back. And so the plot moves further. They despairingly ask him to return his sister to the Mughal Ruba. Well, one thing refuses and takes his sister to the jungle. And we learn about the anti sikh persecution by the Mughal army. So all elements of history are present there. Saraswati finds purpose with her brother serving the wounded Sikhs uh, as part of Seva. Uh, Brother-sister duo is captured again. So uh, I'm wondering, this, this novel has an interesting plot, it has mystique, it has suspense, it has all the end, it has sikhi, that's the ground of the novel, uh, but somehow when it is read and interpreted, there comes these diversions. So there's potential torture and forced conversion to Islam expected for Balwan Singh and uh, Sundri uh, Saraswati would be forcibly married. Uh, but then Sadar Sham Singh, the Jathas, you know, if you are familiar with the missile history, I think it, it really uh, makes an impact in the novel. So his band of warriors to seek and rescue the captives, they do a surprise attack and rescue is accomplished. Saraswati at this point desires to be initiated as a Khalsa woman and serve the Jatha with her service as a woman warrior. So from Saraswati she becomes Sundri, uh, living amidst the six soldiers, serving them selflessly. Sundri comes across a wounded Mughal man whom she then brings back to health. Unfortunately, he captures Sundri again to be married off to the Nabab. So frequent uh, capturing and then release, and that has been extensively talked about by critics uh, to, to make uh, drive their point forward. Lakhat Rai's anger against the six uh, is, is shown in one quote, and so we do see these historical references brought up in the novel. To be a Sikh, to be counted as one of them is the reason. Either return to your old, real Hindu religion, or be prepared forthwith to lose your life. Uh, so more intrigue and more suspense comes in. After Sundri's capture, Bijra Singh is sent out disguised as a Muslim fakir, who then follows the Mughal Nawab. Uh, so again, as I mentioned, there's also espionage in this novel. Uh, by Veer Singh's authorial interventions while describing the small holocaust of the Chota Galugara, uh, he says, the conflicts of the Khalsa present a great contrast to present day gatherings. The latter end in smoke of words, the vapory wrath that end up and down in pleasant nothing. 
So military bravado of the Khalsas and their superior collective decision making through Gurmatas are also shared in the novel. So the novel does, I mean, in 1898, does open up the space to understand Sikhi from so many uh, different angles. We learn about cruelties of Meel Manu and Lakpat Rai, as well as Divan Khoramal's pro Sikh sympathies, uh, which enable us to understand the geopolitical climate of the times. So, Bhaiveer Singh's critique of the indifference and historical apathy is clear when he points to the ingratitude of Indians, especially Sikhs, to, quote, not have been able to erect a dumb memorial in their honor for our future generations. Sundari is once again a prisoner of the Mughal Nawab of Dwaba, gravely injured, and the Nawab cares for her in secrecy, making her believe that she is in a Sikh camp. Another rescue mission, Sundari is, however, fatally injured by the Nawab. So, this is kind of a basic understanding of the, how the novel uh, sums up this plot. In writing, uh, and I am quoting from the author's preface mentioned in this book, in writing this little brochure, it has been by no means our aim nor to be aimed by any beauty of language or style of literary architecture. Our task has been a humble one of presenting a picture of the unselfish Sikh life. Our purpose has been that if perchance once again the Sikh nation may wake up, from their lethargic existence of today, renounce all untruth and live more and have their being in the great spirit of discipleship. And that they may stand firm and straight in the purity of their faith, neither fearing nor causing fear, exampling the great truth proclaimed by the 10th Guru, Guru Gobind Singh. Uh, so now I want to move to the critical reception uh, and first start a bit about the introduction, which by the way, Jodh and Amandeep is amazing. It, it really captures so many of the issues that need to be talked about. So the critical reception showcases the variety of responses that have been well addressed by this introduction. Uh, framing the novel, uh, through such lenses uh, from Punjab studies, Sikh feminism and post-colonialism uh, kind of helps us understand uh, how the critical trajectory, how the novel has been received and continues to be interpreted from these particular lenses. So framing the novel through len such lenses creates, and this is a quote from their introduction, a demand to look at the text through a sense of alterity and strangeness, subtly asking the reader to be attentive to interpretation of its heterogeneous content. Furthermore, it introduces, and I really like this phrasing, traumatic conflict within the reader, rendering a necessary foreground to internalize an ideological and symbolic problem with the text and through it problematize the belief system that it reflects. While Singh and Carl acknowledge that their approach to power dynamics of episteme knowledge production is neutral, they are right in questioning the critical engagement towards the novel in terms of estrangement and otherness by some scholars. And I, I like some of the questions. What makes Sundari so complex in scholarly discourses, despite being so easy for Sikhs to relate with her experiences? That's a great question, and it's, it's obvious. It helps us see why this gap between scholarship and uh, the common readership. To an extent, I agree with them that the inertia of colonialism uh, in post-colonial studies has intervened and misplaced the uh, coherence with which Sikh imagination perceived Sundri. The blind spots accrued in interpreting the novel purely in terms of identity formation or historicism are also well addressed uh, in this introduction. I also appreciate uh, their discussion on Bhai Veer Singh's theorization on history and its diverse undercurrents, uh, literary, sahitic, narrative, vartantic, and spiritual, which is academic. What I'm more uh, inquisitive about is their notion, uh, noticing of a critical fixation on themes of identity construction and feminist meanings. 
So in, in a deliberate simplified manner, I want to present some of the critical objections to this novel by some of the scholars. Uh, and uh, so bear with me. So C. Christine Fair says, uh, by piercing and defining sick woman for was demonstrating, quote, a significant contempt for his female contemporaries. On the English translations of Sundri, uh, she says, because these texts are not books on Sikhism, they are fiction. So it's kind of an attempt to define what this book is uh, by, uh, I would say, non-Sikh uh, scholars as well. And uh, in, in the same essay, she says, such novels are exceedingly suitable for imagining the creation of such a Khalistan. Uh, so 1898, this is, this is kind of foregrounding for, as per this scholar. So this scholar is uh, interpreting the novel in distinct ways. The heroines of these English texts are conveyances by which female sexuality is checked and subordinated to the needs of the punk. Uh, then interpreting Sudri by Anshu Malhotra, another critic, uh, and she says, uh, seen as part literature and part history, or even a deliberate blooding of the two to make fictional seem historical, Sundri was burdened with many stories to tell and many projects pertinent to the future of the community and self that it hoped to construct. In the genealogical story that BVS tells in Sundri, he constructs a biomythography that sweetens the past of an ancestor developing a myth of his sickness in order to fit in with the needs of the present. The reason I'm sharing this quotation is just to kind of have you look at how the critics are trying to approach this novel uh, and try to mold it in, uh, which connects to what Professor Monday's earlier part of discussion, Punjabiyat versus Sikhi says, Carefully chosen scriptural passages, as well as sick hagiographic and martyrological accounts, all virtually impossible to establish as a historical fact, were carefully utilized to design the Sikh utopia constructed by Peel Singh. Uh, this article is, is, is quite problematic, it kind of tangent, tangentially moves from one issue to another, but we don't really get an understanding of Sundri as it should be read. By Wilson associates women with the deterioration of Sikhism, Sundri, in a sense, becomes the pulpit upon which he is able to guide and especially chastise Sikh women for their degenerate customs and habits. So these are some of the ideas that critical scholars, some scholars have mentioned about Sundri. I also want to clarify uh, there are some scholars who have appreciated the nuances of Sikhi as they are represented in this novel. So Nikki Kunindar Kaur does identify uh, Nam Japna, Kirat Karna, Vanchakna, those Sikh principles as embodied. Uh, so Sundri becomes a model of that representation. So are six knowable or incomprehensible? This is basically a kind of larger project that I'm trying to work on. So uh, I'm glad Professor Mandir talks, uh, talked about in his earlier keynote about the secularization and secular uh, episteme, and I, I kind of also deal with that in my project, so I'll briefly talk about that. How do we challenge the secular episteme? So I know these are a lot of questions I'm raising, but my goal is to find the answers, hopefully through discussions and through further uh, analysis. Secularism and the politics of interpretation. Is a secularist approach uh, the viable approach to interpret such texts as Haivi Singh Sundri? How does secularization strip Sikhi of its distinct religious leanings and its theological differences from the dominant slash mainstream discourse? What are the limits, or rather bold exaggerations, of secular knowledge production that further bolsters the project of Sikh otherness? Uh, and so secular approach and questions of critique, how, how are uh, Sikh representations critique? You know, what kind of critical uh, interpretations come out through the secular approach? I'm trying to address that. What kinds of narrativity would questioning secular approaches or interpretations entail? 
how does one look at the fantasy of inclusion that is entailed within secularist approaches without ignoring the cloak of invisibility that secular perspectives promote? So Sikhi becomes invisible in this whole notion of inclusivity. Can religion speak back to secularism in meaningful ways or is such an exercise a futile project, project of impossibility? How does secularization constitute and inscribe a religion's ethos through strategic displacements and even totalitarian disciplinary formation? So these kind of questions help us understand, especially when non-Sikh scholars are interpreting a novel like by Beit Singh Sumri. What are then the limits of cultural productions within secularist frameworks? Uh, so I am also interested and I do explore in my other work, sick anxiety and discontent. The sick anxiety is thus an impossible anxiety that is never addressed. Instead, it is further objectified within sick phobic, rhetorical or critical approaches filtered through structures of negation. So the ideas of lack, this is, it, it doesn't have this, it doesn't have that, those kind of, you know, uh, pinpointing uh, issues, but totally ignoring the sick ethos becomes problematic in such kind of uh, criticism. Through deliberate practice of interpretation as a targeted operation, when sick meaning is limited, reduced, or rendered as an unrelated other, and estranged from its understanding, Sick meaning is thus circumscribed as an other before it even enters the discourse or sometimes remains marginalized. So the idea is of pretty crisis and sick epistemes, uh, how sick knowledge production is circulated. When the social realities around Sikhi are left unacknowledged in the mainstream critiques, they cause a narrative crisis, which then must be underscored through critical theory and diagnose social pathologies around interpreting and framing Sikhi. The dire need of an ideological framing within Sikh ethos, Sikh knowledge production, and Sikh viewpoint or drishti that can empower a critical framework whereby issues of representation are critiqued from within Sikhi, not without Sikhi. So we need to understand Sundri within Sikhi, we will get a more uh, enriching experience as a reader and even as a scholar. Uh, this is a little bit of my problematic uh, project that I'm trying to work undoing Sikh feminism, so I'm trying to explore, I do teach about feminism, so it's not just a, a random reaction. Uh, so I'm familiar with Western feminism, uh, black feminism, Sikh feminism, so what are the uh, strands that we need to explore? Sikh feminism, when it becomes a trickle-down pro process of white appeasing, assimilatory adaptation of Western feminism, seemingly adopted uncritically as a plagiarized concept, initiates a whitewash mainstream identification rather than Sikh identification. So this disjuncture that comes in uh, with from a feminist approach, uh, we need to explore that. A discourse from a Sikh feminist lens that is only hinged on the rhetoric of black limits a radical understanding of Sikh ethos as defined by the Sikh gurus. And simply to erase or disacknowledge it then becomes a hegemonic exercise of controlling Sikh subjectivity. How are the social realities, I'm almost at the end of my talk, how are the social realities around Sikhi acknowledged in the mainstream critiques? Can we build a distinctive approach to examine the crisis of narrative, representations, and interpretations in the Sikh context? What can be the role of critical theory in diagnosing social pathologies around Sikhi? Such questions can pave the way to critique the function of critique per se. The discursive engagement with Sikh traditions and ideologies, for instance, must engender from a Sikh framework rather than non-Sikh frameworks. This is where application of critical theory can assist in providing crucial insights in terms of metacriticism, to talk about criticism, you know, how is criticism done, and the limits. 
Even the dangers of assumptions when priory ideals are ignored are overlooked in the interest of emancipatory insights. Uh, Professor Monday's reference to medieval, right? So medieval. So we are all medieval, right? Because we follow Sikhi. So reading Sundri with a Sikh-centric diagnostic lens is, is my proposal that, that helps us understand the novel. So how can we read this kind of text, and I'm suggesting, uh, without rhetorical apologetics of by Veer Singh's Khalsa-centric approach, Sundari should be appreciated for its questions on Sikh subjectivity as well. And I want to end with a, a quotation from Professor Pudin Singh, never was Eastern or Western woman so free as when she rose like Sundari, the nurse sister of the Khalsa in times when the Sikh were pitched against the Mughal Empire. Sundari so chose her own vocation, dedication, her whole freed life as a sister nurse, a life of the Khalsa and his force. Uh, thank you. So this is part of what I've been trying to uh, work around. Uh, thank you. I've been asked to uh, outline some of the key points in the talk. I think what I'll do is I'll pass on that simply because we are so behind time. Uh, we need to catch up by at least half an hour during the lunch break as well, so it's going to be a little curtailed. But there were so many questions there that, that require answering. And um, when we, you know, one of the discussions I was having during the break was around um, uh, community organization and, and community responses to some of uh, the, the, this kind of what was going on. Um, I, you know, I think as a community we need to be educated about the frameworks that are often invisible to us and I think uh, Dr. Mehta did a great job of kind of uh, outlining those. But we need a much deeper discussion on this and I think uh, maybe a follow-up to this would be, would be great. So let me, let me uh, introduce our second speaker uh, who is Dr. Harleen Kaur. Uh, Dr. Harleen Kaur is a, an assistant teaching professor uh, in sociology at uh, Arizona State University. Um, apart from her academic interests, she has very wide uh, uh, other interests which include working with Sikh youth to develop genuine connections with Gurmat consciousness. So, uh, Dr. Harleen Kaur, please come to the stage. Um, somehow there's a trend that I always end up being the last speaker before lunch, so hopefully I'll keep you all entertained. So um, I'm, I'm really grateful to the previous speakers. I think actually, hopefully I'll be pulling upon a lot of the threads that they have already introduced. What I'd like to do is actually um, offer a close engagement with one of the excellent questions posed in the introduction, which Dr. Mehta already um, quoted. So early in the introduction, Harjot Gaur and Amandeep Singh ask um, a really important question of what makes Sundari so complex in scholarly discourses, despite being so easy for Sikhs to relate with her experience. Throughout their introduction and through this uh, translational endeavor, editor Harjot Gaur poses a crucial question around the possibilities for an embodied approach to Sikh studies, one that is not bound by the categorical materialist implications of our globalized world. My angle of analysis today will be one of the political implications of translation. However, I'm not simply interested in translation as a product of carrying across, moving from one language to another for the purpose of disseminating information as if it were an innocent and unmarked vessel. Instead, in order to attempt to answer the question of the complexity of Sundari for academic discourse, I want to think about translation as a, as a product of archival recovery and historical narrativization. To start, what I'll have us consider is how academic tradition and epistemological orientations have typically viewed historical narrative, their approaches to analyzing and understanding such information, and the confines of historical legitimacy in academic discourse. So uh, to do so, we start with the colonial archive, which has been the primary legitimate site of information for academics in six studies and otherwise, to glean information from the time about which by Gibson writes. While the colonial archive was originally constructed simply as an arm of the ruling power in order to document strategies and successes of rule, 
it has now been transformed by academics from an object, object of governance into a source of study. What this means, though, is that scholarly discourse using the archive to define sort of the terms of truth or reality are often limited by the same logics that colonialism used to govern. Archives themselves, as the physical body, are still organized by the categories, regions, time periods, and departments of the ruler. To actually trace documents across these organizing logics, especially in larger national archives, can prove near impossible. Since the colonial archive represents this certain form of colonial relationality, re relationality through its physical structure, it often predetermines the relationalities which can or cannot be traced through its remaining files. Um, as further stated by Anjali Arondekar, the archive's strength lie not in its ability to manifest and materialize differentiated histories of rule, but in putting forth an epistemological frame that binds ongoing subjectivity formation to colonial logics through its function as a permanent referential source. Since the archive is the primary legitimate source to study history within academia, over things like oral tradition and community sources, what Erondekar means is that the archive's main contribution is forcing scholarly discourses of history to keep using the same categories, the same knowledge structures of colonialism to define and understand the present. This is actually, I think, what is most crucial to understand around scholarly discourses around Sundri. However, there are alternate approaches to the archive. Archival approaches like critical fabulation intertwine archival documents with fictional elements to dig out and fill silences in the archive as the archive will always represent a singular narrative of history. Thinking through engagement with the archive as an act of production rather than excavation, in which the academic is also constructing their own narrative of said documents, helps us understand that the colonial production of social boundaries for political regulation are often knowingly or unknowingly reproduced through archival research. In this setting, it is also important to contextualize how colonized communities have come to value an archived life for state legibility amidst, amidst progressivist and liberal discourse. That's from Judge and Bar 2021. Uh, for example, the desire, which they talk about in their paper, to trace six as the original pioneers and settlers within California as a way to gain power by state logics. All of this context is important to understand the reception and reaction to good myth inspired narratives of Sikh life within Sikh academic discourse. Um, looks like we've lost our slides here, but hopefully I'll, I'll try and read the quotes slowly. Um, so the, the next kind of further context that I want to offer is that of historical narrativization, particularly as put by US historian and literary critic Hayden White. White, in his 2009 book, The Content of the Form, argues that historical narrativization emerges from a particular impulse to create closure or a clean ending around historical events. Uh, those which we know by living in the f uh, history of the future are simply not realistic for the depiction of historical facts as they occurred. But in writing and publishing history, what happens is that history actually turns into an art form that is simultaneously, simultaneously created but also binding. While the urge to narrativize history into a clean story or a singular memory is construed as something as simple as style or structure choices, White actually calls this disciplining history, where narrative plot structure is imposed upon historical facts to determine what could be studied as legitimate capital H history. Thus, he puts forth a framework of the narrativization of history, which he argues all historical discourse inevitably does. By nature of the human psyche, in which a particular moral order is established for the facts as they are retold through a historical narrative. This binds the reality of interpretation to one set of ideals while claiming it is about accuracy or understanding historical context. Unfortunately, we have many examples of this, even contemporarily. We can consider the long-standing and ongoing dehumanization of Palestinian lives that we are witnessing in the US mass media and political sphere right now. So what to take away from White as we move towards analyzing Sundari? This quote from Hayden White sums it up. What I have sought to suggest is that this value attached to narrativity and the representation of real events arises out of a desire to have real events display the coherence, integrity, fullness, and closure of an image of life that is and can only be imaginary. Essentially, the historic historical narrative as it is created can only be imaginary. 
If all historical narrative must contain some level of the imaginary in order to develop a closed story, what does that say about the discourse around Sundri and the story itself? Relatedly, I want to push back slightly on one point made in the introduction around the notion of narrative discourse in academia. On page 10, the editors make, editor makes the point that in order to extricate Sikh imagination and Sikh womanhood from dominant critiques and conversations, they will bring forth, quote, an unspoken relationship with the text without any subjective preset convictions, end quote. Here, I want to ask us to resist the academic and perhaps colonial desire, not unlike those generated through a colonial archive, to capture or cultivate a pseudo-objectivity. Perhaps it is driven by a fear of subjectivity or the siloing that happens as a result of supposed subjectivity, as has happened within six studies for generations. But instead, taking up the notion of conviction, we can move towards an uncapturable, totally illegible experience of Gunma that can only be understood through the resonance of embodiment. In other words, the relatability of Sundri. In his own work on the translatability of embodied convictions, Talal Asad suggests that researchers and academics must approach the project of translation with the reverential attitude on the part of the believer towards the creator. He argues that generating scholarship on Islam that is rooted in conviction rather than terror or surveillance allows Islamic epistemologies to sit, quote, uneasily within the ambition of state power and the pervasiveness of capitalist exchange, end quote. Um, forces and institutions whose desires for power would rather claim a neat translation, or in the words of Hayden White, a closure of an image of life. In this way, Professor Budensen was the perfect translator for Sundri, as the editor highlights, through his tutelage under Baibir Singh. In a sense, he held this embodied conviction of the historical discourse that Baibir Singh employed to articulate a narrative of Gunmat life. The implications of such convictions are only seen through direct comparison where on page 27 to 28, Professor Budan Singh depicts the life of the Khalsa in, in beautiful words. Professor Budan Singh says, the Sikhs are ordained to rise early, dip their minds in the colors of the dawn, dip their bodies in cold pond water, and dip their souls in the songs of the Guru. Both their day and night are to drip like a raining sky with the divine water which, which, with which the Guru baptizes them. Within just these two short lines, Professor Budin Singh effortlessly, excuse me, Professor Budin Singh effortlessly collapses centuries of time and space, uttering the hukams of Guru Sahib, of the Sikhs who wrote Ratnamme in their wake, of the embodied lives of conviction that surge forward into the present and future. Such depictions of nom-centric life can only be done through preset convictions of Namras and Goshavit, I'll argue. So now I want to draw upon um, passages of the book to examine three areas of debate around Sundri and Sikh womanhood broadly. The role of the Sikh woman, the position of the Sikh woman in relation to the Banth or other Sikhs, and the possibilities for Sikh womanhood in Banthik Seva. I want to argue that the same way narrative techniques like critical fabulation move beyond the limitations of reality, in a similar way, Sundri does this by exemplifying what Sikh women look and sound like when free from the limitations of worldly categorization and restraint. So in the first quote on page 27, somebody says, you might have a suspicion of my being a woman, of my weak feminine frame and heart. I wish the suspicion be removed. Let me plead for my kind. Woman in its truest sense is but a soul. Her mind, heart, and body are weak because of her inner strength. Her soul, when agitated, possesses her mind and heart. She becomes like a rock, and then who can move her? I dare say this, not so much because of my being a woman, as of my trust in the everlasting faithfulness of the great Guru towards their disciples and the disciples of his Sikh. I want to pull upon one line that I had bolded, that is, a woman in its truest sense is but a soul. So Sikhi is such a transformative tradition because of the ongoing restraints of social categories and their political implications. Whether or not an individual ties value to these social categories, our globalized world continually assesses the worth and purpose of bodies through these categories of identity, which have been constructed to justify violence and hierarchies of power. In Stanton's 10 stages of genocide, the first four have nothing to do with taking up arms or anything to do with governance, but are actually all ideological and symbolic before a single weapon has been lifted. Large states and powers dehumanize humans first in theory before in practice, setting the foundation for mass violence. 
It is this human instinct to dehumanize that Sundari resists when she defines the sick woman. Drawing upon Gunmuth notions of the Sohagin, as I, I'll get back to, she offers a clear reminder in the bolded line that while sick women are impacted by social categories, sick womanhood still has the capacity to go beyond such limitations to witness the Prakash of Atma through one's devotion to Guru. The second quote, um, this is after Sundari has received Khande Bhakti Kipal. Sundari got the immortal gift of Guru's baptism, and they, referring to the missal, the immortal gift of a sister. Every one of them had, for the sake of the holy war, been long deprived of the angelic innocence and selfless affection of a woman, both mother, sister, and wife, and of that pure solace of soul which is in the godly shadows of woman's love. In spite of their living in Guru's song, the military life and its hardships had created a dry wilderness in their personal affections, which only a woman's tears can make green. There were empty spaces of soul which only the sight of a sister like somebody could fill up. A new glow, a new color, a new divine warmth came upon them, the loss of which they had not felt till it was recouped. And those deep prayers of thankfulness went out to their sister-filled hearts, the prayers that can only come from that fragrant spontane spontaneousness of an enriched and satiated soul when the hungry ones are fed, the separated mates are united, the distressed ones are relive, relieved, the prisoners liberated, and the emptied souls refilled with God's grace. This quote comes from 28 to 29. So in this passage, it's clear that Sundari generates the spirit of Avdipa of Renam Dipada. For the Sikh is nothing without their guru, as Sundari's life clearly depicts. Imaginary or not, Sundari's life of devotion makes the Nirgun Sargun, or by Gurdasji's words, Saad Sangatvich Alaklakaya. Her presence amongst the Sikh, Gur Sikhs, allows them to witness the spirit of Guru Sahib again through her resistance to the violence and dehumanization that surrounds them constantly. While passages, passages as this one can be read easily through a material notion of woman, as they often have been by some of these critics, only a representation of Punjabi, patriarchy, and gender roles through a typical feminist lens. What would it mean to move beyond such limited frameworks and instead consider the role of the Sohagun as real? Instead, Sundari is not bound by her feminine spirit, but able to lead her Gursik family towards Nam through the spirit of the bride, tender and compassionate, filled with light. Rather than be limited by femininity, Sundari is able to remove the limitations of material violence and harshness of the world from the Sikhs around her, especially the men. I also want to put forth the point, um, because I think often from the Western feminist lens, the the threat of sexual violence is often coded as isith within South Asian or Punjabi communities. But I actually think by Veer Singh makes a more humanizing move by resisting, um, as Harjot Gaudi brilliantly put, resisting the specter of the masculine by refusing to introduce this common trope of sexual violence into Sundri's life story. Um, that this is actually a humanization of the liberated Sikh woman to, to refuse that um, experience. The final quick quote, um, this is at, you know, when Sundari has been injured and um, basically before her passing. So, Sundari, the beloved Sundari, the soul of the Khalsa fell unconscious. Blood gushed out of her wound. The rose-like glowing face of Sundari turned pale and wan. And there she lay, white like a marble statue. O Sundari, thy mercy turned out to be thy destroyer. Sardar Sham Singh had many a time apprised thee of this danger, but thy mercy knew no cautions of political experience, from page 90. To be committed to service beyond political realities is another way to think about how to enact gunmat in spite of worldly limitations. As the introduction points out, seva is not an inherently gendered practice. Instead, as a community and as scholars, the moral order with which we have written a narrative of Sikhi has bound such transformative and boundless practices through the same categories that it was actually meant to upend. In his series of essays, Creative Unity, also referenced in the introduction, Rabindranath Tagore posits that through globalization and modernity, we have come to accept separation as natural and power as the ultimate manifestation of life. Post-colonial scholars like Franz Fanon discuss the psychological impact of colonial rule on the human, human psyche, in which the experience of brutal power forces the colonized subject to accept domination as the only form of real true power. Sikhi, of course, refuses this through the notion of a godlook. 
Tagore so offers similar analyses to Fanon, but instead offers that the true harm is the inability to realize divine power within ourselves, for we only seek it in material and fu- human form. Mantu Jotsu Pafanam Mulpachan. This is perhaps useful context behind the implicit desire of so many critics of Sundri to necessarily read the novel as patriarchal and reaffirming, gen- reaffirming gender roles. When violence and oppression is the language of study and human psychological tendency, it is easy to read it into everything. Rather than rejecting modernity and civilization, Tagore complicates ideas of how humanity can coexist and the purpose for social life. Tagore argues that by engaging with the creative elements of life, it is possible to understand divinity through social and material life. He says, our society exists to remind us through its various voices that the ultimate truth in man is not in his intellect or his possessions, it is in his illumination of mind, in his extension of sympathy across all castes and color, in his recognition of the world, not merely as a storehouse of power, but as a habitation of man's spirit with its eternal music of beauty and its inner light of the divine presence. Sundri embodies such possibilities through her continuous rejection of a closure of narrative. Rather than consider the story to be written or defined along lines of power and community boundaries, her imaginative reality is unlimited through Nagas. She lives in the flow of hukam and does not limit her behavior based on the political limitations of the world she lives in. Instead, what is the closure that Sundri Kaur herself offers as she departs her physical embodied form? That of Gushal. From Ram Jatsri on Anga Satsono of Sri Guru Granth Sahib Ji. Pari, Mal Leo Deal, Tape Dwarya, Rakh Levo Din Deal, Ramat Boharya, Pavit Vachal, Tera Bentahar, Patit Udarya, Tuj Binahi Koi, Bino Boinsarya, Kal Gan Leo Deal, Sagar Sansarya, Kal Gan Leo Deal, Sagar Sansarya. In the Gurmat narrative, closure is inevitable. We must all cross this world ocean one day, but whether we have the boat of the Guru to do so or not is up to our own karam. Returning, in a final sense, to the struggles within academic discourse on Sundari, we need not desire to locate intelligibility or pursue literary analysis with set goals or outcomes. In a sense, this also parts ways with Gurmat orientations. Raj na chao, mukt na chao, man preet jalan kam nare, as revealed by Guru Arjun Bhatsha. On the other hand, it is not possible to analyze Sundri, the character, or the novel without the preset convictions of Gunman. To do so would be to enact a false translation, a mismatched <coughs> moral order, on a narrative about what happens when we are transformed by Grisham. Why would you got called Sundri? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fascinating paper. Both papers, I think, um, were fascinating and powerful in the way they both point towards what is the central problem, I think, that uh, the Sikh narrative is facing, which is essentially uh, epistemic sovereignty, the sovereignty of the modern knowledge system and the way that it organizes the knowledge, concepts, and systems of non Western cultures. And I think both pa- papers brought this up quite beautifully. So instead of giving a narrative on both of these papers, uh, uh, we, we have just five minutes, maybe I could invite the audience to give some very pointed questions, questions that directly, um, uh, I think, articulate the, the thesis that's being put across by both of these speakers. So I'll take one or two questions for both Dr. Mehta and Dr. Harleen. I wonder if you could join us. And you can ask a question, and then maybe because the papers are overlapping so nicely, they could, uh, the speakers could both uh, have a go at answering them. Thank you. Yeah. So I was really interested in the criticism that you pointed out, Ravinder, um, about um, you know, by Veer Singh is trying to like solve all the problems in Sikhi, like in this one novel. But at the same time, in his introduction, you, you know, he says himself that he's trying to save Sikhi, right? I mean, it's one attempt to, um, so like, how do you kind of like frame that? Like, do you really, because when I read it for the first time, that's how I sort of felt, I was overwhelmed with all the, um, 
issues and concerns he has, right? And so, like, I just want to see how you felt about that. Like, you know. Okay. Uh, I love talking, Raman, about this, but I will try to be as concise. Uh, 1898 was also the year when Henrik Ibsen, a Norwegian playwright, wrote a play called Hedda Gabler, and I know this because I teach that. But why I'm mentioning that is, when Bhai Veer Singh's novel is kind of related to other kind of uh, creative uh, texts that are being produced, with Ibsen, what happened was he portrayed almost in all of his works, he mostly wrote plays, he talked about this Western womanhood, right, the new woman. And the concept of new woman that he was talking about, uh, the leadership, you know, they tried to adopt it, uh, look at him as a feminist writer, and Ibsen denied, he said, I'm not a feminist writer, I'm a human rights, you know, I'm a human rights thinker. So when I was reading uh, Sundri, I was looking at these uh, parallel, you know, how to look at it, uh, you know, issues of authority, right? When an author portrays some subject, you know, how do we look at it? And when the outside, you know, non-authorial reception, when, when I say non-authorial, others, readers who read that text, they try to impose labels on it. So you are right, Bhai Veer Singh's novel is, 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 is doing so much, and the element of humility, I think it is also derived from Sikhi, you know, not to brag. I mean, in the introduction, the preface, he says, this is no literary architecture. But I have honestly enjoyed reading this novel second time, third time, so much more because it has that literary potential. Uh, some critics, for instance, can I just speak for 10 more seconds? Uh, some critics mention and they object to this mixing of, you know, history and uh, reality. Sundra is a fictional character, but if we are familiar with Sikh history, we can see traces of how she is an epitome, she is a model of Sikh womanhood, right? Uh, Harleen mentioned uh, Tagore. I was planning to also think about Tagore's concept of womanhood, but uh, let me let me come back to on track, and I kind of forgot my point, what I was trying to say. But uh, the idea is, when we look at a text like Sundri, it's the objection to it that Bhai Veer Singh in 1898 was blending genres. He was going through history, he was going through, you know, all poetry. This, this is Shia poetry also. And I'm reminded of uh, Maxine Hall Kingston, uh, one of the authors that I worked on in my dissertation. When she came out with her memoir, The Mac uh, Woman Warrior, she uses elements of magic realism, history, similar kind of concept, and Bhai Veer Singh had already done that. So in many ways, this work is very innovative, and despite his humility in saying that this is no grand text, it is indeed a grand text, and I think we need to read more and write more about it. I hope I was able to address some of what you asked. Thank you. Only John join. Yes, fine. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I think I think that really answered it very thoroughly. I guess. Um, the one point I'll add, which I tried to get at in my talk, is that the question of power and from which kind of standpoint someone is speaking always matters. So for by using to attempt to save a Sikh discourse or narrative is a very different question than the critics sort of coming and saying, oh, you're saving a particular. I think I'm really appreciative that everyone today highlighted the importance of being a practitioner of Sikhi, because I think that often gets dismissed by academic conversations, that that's not a valid perspective. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that's just the short contribution I'll make, is that the, the perspective from which someone is taking on a particular task matters a lot here. Yeah, I, I know Edward's hungry and we're looking to lunch in a minute, but there's time for one question which addresses both of the speakers. Few seconds. 
Okay, you're hungry. <laughs> so let's close this session. Thank you uh, to both of our speakers for wonderfully rich uh, presentations. Lunch is being served uh, one floor up. It's in the third floor atrium. So just go onto the stairs and onto the third floor, please. Or you can take the elevator as well. I'm really excited to get started with the second half of our day. Um, I think the morning was really enlightening and um, probably created more questions than answers, which is always the mark of a really good conference, I think. Um, so uh, we have a few speakers in the afternoon session. Um, I think we're going to start with um, Gurpreet Kaur. She's an independent scholar with interests in literature and poetry. And she has a much longer um, biography than this, so I really uh, would like her to introduce herself a little bit. Um, she's a really um, active member of the local Sikh community. Um, and she has two daughters, and she um, has, she's a full-time career woman, as well as being very, very involved in a lot of our book studies that we've been doing at the Gurdwara. And I'm sure there's much more. No, so please join us. Yes. So I would like to first extend my gratitude for giving me an opportunity to speak on this book. I'm going to convey the message what I received from this book rather than critically analyzing it. So it's basically a summary for what I got from it. Um, I'm, um, the title Sundri, first of all, stayed with me for long and I was wondering before reading the book that what is it about? Of course, when the title is Sundri, we associate it with beauty. And I would like to begin with the following sentence that I, um, I read in the article sent to me by Nal Pradas that was published in Makram, their publication, which states, which I feel does associate with characteristics of Sundri, her inner beauty. Beauty is a crystallization of some aspect of universal joy. It is something limitless expressed by means of a limit. It is a reflection of divine bliss, and since God is truth, the reflection of his bliss will be that mixture of happiness and truth, which is to be found in all beauty. So it's the superabundance and equilibrium of the divine qualities, and at the same time, overflowing of the existential potentialities contained in pure being. It stems from the divine love. It belongs to its creator, who thought, who through it, it projects into the world of appearances something of his being. So I associate it with this topic of the book. Um, I figured how Pai Virsi has conveyed the essence of Sundari to uphold moral and spiritual conduct and trying to construe a resolute and concrete identity of the society. The book starts with an intro where it says, history many a times arrive at an age where the meaning of being's existence and nature of her essence finds itself at the crossroad of an implied desentiment. Now, what is desentiment? In the dictionary, it says to lose or shift from an established center of focus. It fur it, it's further referring to that the desentiment dislocates the historic forms of beings, meanings, signs, symbols, and collective imagination but it also dis dislocates the contents of history. I feel after reading the introduction that extensive research that has been done on the topic where different scholars have given their views and touched the point that they took from the book, for example, the culture, the feminist, the women of that era, etc. But there are some undertones that were left behind as well, which remained inaccessible or buried under ideological conceptualizations. I feel this edition has revisited the book from a fresh perspective, revealing its interpretive openness from you know, historical perspective. And with an open mind and have touched the areas which were not discussed before. So the introduction also underlines the conceptual ideas that remains dominant in discourses around Sundari. It's this, I'm referring this from the book itself. It is to recover the kernel of conceptual framework that holds the possibilities to extricate Sikh imagination, particularly that of Sikh women, from captivities of dominant discourses, thereby introducing a fresh perspective in its undercurrents. So here the effort went above and beyond to recenter us to be able to see the book from fresh set of eyes. 
The book is based on theory of mother principle, as Aurobindo has coded, and is also mentioned in this in the introduction that the idea of unity sprouts from the unity of life, and spirit that help possess it possess at once your higher self and the self of all creatures. He means that the race, the society, the nation has to move collectively towards the spiritualization of life. I found it very, very um, powerful. Um, as we know, Sundri is the first novel, which is, you know, has been described before too, that came uh, from the pen of Pai Veer Singh. It was conceived during the time period where it was imperative to boost the morals of the, morals of the Sikh, Sikhs. That's what I felt. He was surcharged with the spirit to redeem the glory of the Sikhs and with abundance of knowledge, wrote heavy literature of didactic nature. Um, he had a purpose in view and his entire efforts were to achieve the same by awakening the masses and the intellectuals to imbibe practical aspects of Sikh religion. So in his own words, he said, increasing people in our rank seem to be turning their back on a glorious past. The book stresses the need of recapturing the divine spirit of the Khalsa created by Guru Gobind Singh. The Khalsa represents spiritually elevated people who are blissfully cheerful, fearless, invincible, but non-aggressive. The book, uh, in his own words, it says, the book highlights the glorious manner in which the Khalsa remains steadfast to its high principles, even when faced with the greatest odds. Let us hope that it would help us to re-imbibe the spirit of courage, humanity, compassion, and all the divine qualities with which our forefathers were gifted. Further, in, in the intro that I've written, is that um, it's, uh, we all know it's based on a popular folk song. Sundri is a symbolic representative of beauty and strength. The story depicts incidents and events which inculcate universal brotherhood and love for humanity. Um, but she also operates at a meta level in which free play of imagination, dyna dyna dynamism of his history, dualities in time and space, metaphysical tensions in power struggles, affirmation of living experiences, radiance of spirit, spiritual meanings, anxiety of human condition, expression of free will, risk, everything, um, the fear of life perpetu perpetuating in the shadow of death, etc. gets full expression within its plot. Through his writing, Pai Veer Singh succeeded not only in restoring the morals of the people of his time, but also is providing the Punjabi, his mother tongue, the honor and glory long denied to it as a result of political and cultural slavery. This is what I got. Um, the f I feel that he wrote all his fictional works with a purpose in mind, and the purpose was to awaken in the six the sense of chivalry and to instill in them a sense of pride in their cultural and rich heritage. He has, shown, he has shown us the soul of Khalsa, of who we truly are, what our characteristics should be, like living on our own terms, mental strength, perseverance, seva, treating everyone equally, no enmity, namras. I do feel that her joke has raised a voice in presenting the translation true to its meaning. She's covered all and every aspects of the novel, be it feminism, Sikh history, strength of character, um, by writing or editing this book, an action has been taken towards the direction to rightly, to point it rightly to the audience to make them understand the soul of the novel. Many commentaries before discuss the mode of expression, the plot in the novel, and Pai Veer Singh's approach towards Sikh ideals, historical conditions, and his motivations. Some scholars, as mentioned in the book, say Sundri is a living embodiment of the ethical ideals espoused, espoused by Guru Nanak, that she possesses the strength of goddess, of Linus, of lightning, her vitality, and her strength. However, her character does go uh, does goes above and beyond these physical dimensions. She shows her mental strength during her transition from a village girl to Sikhi. We see her dedication when she serves the community tirelessly and also when she shows humility, love and care, even for the enemy. But also she never, you know, she's never scared to show her aggressive self at the time of adversity. And the self-realization of the character, how the author is uplifting the protagonist from ordinary to extraordinary. 
how in destruction there is creation, creation of strength, creation of a mother, of new ideas. I feel thus the Sikhi or the cause or the society is moving further. This is how I felt or what I got from the book. Um, the unity of life has been touched by Pai Veer Singh. Through creative unity, the essence of Sundari communicates freely, empathizes and connects with the world. She's rebellious, yet holds the responsibility of her character. And it's also, um, this, the following is also mentioned by her Jyot in the introduction, that Sundari entails the human mind to realize namras while reflecting upon the nature of the text in its wholeness. Through Nam, the Guru body maintains an incident interplay with matter, time, and space around where all occurrences and incidents that the Guru body deals will get, will get emancipated and reconstituted in a coded form of meta-epistemology. Nam therefore primes a path of humanity to decode the codification in its active time and space and unveil new and fresh interpretations of the cosmos around while deriving light from the beacon of the meta epistemology. She's teaching us the path of dharma through her actions and her everyday life. She comes with powerful character based symbolism, combination of spiritual fragment of merit, fragrance, discipline and prodigy. So every character is playing a symbol basically in the in the novel. Some are of spirit and love for the guru, but of course the you know she shines luminously in all the characters because she represents timeless symbol of universal womanhood which inscribes a cosmic relationship between outward and inner beauty, inward beauty. So she represents a body anchored in high spirit, devotion, kindness and love of one guru where she stays in the higher mental realm and love for one guru. So, I, so she's representing the mother principle where her journey starts within the boundaries, her brain, then the transition takes place through her abduction, then the obsessive pursuit of Nabab pulling her towards the worldly pleasures, and, then, and further when she experiences the internal collect, connection of the higher realm between dharma and spirituality, dharma. As she navigates through these realms, the marriage, the abduction, joining Khalsa, Seva, strength, she finally incarnates into Sundari her pure cultural self, governed by dharma and submission to the guru. And as she's progressing, she's serving the humanity selflessly through seva, never forgetting her spiritual destination. She arrives at a point where spiritual transparency prevails and the symbolic incarnation of the mother principle completely shines on her and dawns on her. And finally, when the energy is in its full bloom, I feel, that the, all the sacrifices that she has made for the human at the end, like how naturally bow in front of that spirit. So the book records the collective interplay of the spirit of love and sacrifice. Therefore, not only six, but I feel everyone, everyone should connect with this book and can connect with this book. Um, I further want to touch the topic of seva, that is in her characteristics, which also describes Sikhi, because you know, it is the root, service is the root of Sikhism. Um, as it's mentioned again in this book, Seva derives its practical meaning from the Namras tradition. It renders an opportunity to materialize higher ideals of human life, making these ideals practicable in human society, while espousing that a human being has a higher purpose in life to perform. That is very well said, that Seva unfolds its greater purpose in constituting individual and society habits that transcends logocentric hardening of historical imagination, therefore, thereby it permeating cross human hearts through its, you know, through its uh, connections. I, and I learned from this, uh, you know, from what Harjot has um, mentioned, and I'm not going to touch them, but briefly mention it. Seva constitute of four dimensions. I found it very, um, very um, impressive. First, at ontological level of being, it uplifts individual consciousness through practice that nurture the value of humility. Secondly, at ideological level. Third, at the biophysical level, where Seva derives its higher meaning from namras that opens imagination, 
beyond mind and world, the dualities of mind and world. So, um, so the seva further uh, pr it promotes the sense of togetherness, and the idea of seva resonates a living experience that is overwhelming, overwhelmingly shrined in Sikh texts like Sundari. That is why um, you know Sikhs are like you know we are in news like performing seva and helping communities at war zones and at disaster sites. So this um, book does communicate to everyone on a different level. It communicated to me on this level for what I have presented in front of you. And um, thank you to Harjot and Amandeep uh, for you know presenting you know you know letting me. Uh, presenting this to me so that I, you know it opened up so many new things to me, and of course Professor Jagdish, um, so, you know, this, you know, he's um, been extremely knowledgeable on these um, texts. Um, with this, I would like to wrap up. Um, all I want to say is this book communicates on a different level and is taking up us to the point of realization that transition is important for character development. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gabri. That was beautiful. Um, it got me really excited about reading this book again. Um, I really appreciate, um, like, kind of your personal take and your personal message on this, and how you kind of take us through the journey, both that you took through the book as well as the one that Sundari takes, um, and you know her journey in so many different areas, right? Um, her journey from from Sundari to Khalsa. And um, and your your view of how she looks at how she represents so many different things for each of us. So um, again, I'd like to thank you so much for your for your talk. It was very eye opening, and um, it actually made what seemed really inaccessible very accessible to all of us. So we really appreciate that. Thank you so much again. Um, so next, I would like to invite Sudar Amandeep Singh to speak. Um, he is a researcher and co-author of this introduction to Sundari that we've been discussing all day. And he's also the author of many other books and the uh, editor and organizer. So he has a very long resume that I won't share all of it with you. But he um, is the director of Not For Gas USA. Um, and I just would like to extend a personal note of thanks to um, Sudar Amandeep Singh as well as Sudar Nimar Jodhgaard because um, of many of these things like this conference today and um, the book club at the at Gurdwara Sahib and many other um, endeavors that they've taken on have really enriched our local and, uh, and international community. So I would just like to welcome you as well. Thank you. for this uh, kind introduction. <laughs> I'll try to go as quickly as possible since we are running short of time. So whatever I have learned, this was a, a good journey for all of us to actually, while I was writing, I was also understanding the perspectives from which this, uh, this novel Sundri was actually approached and how it was understood both in the native terms versus vis a vis with the uh, with the western understanding of the uh, of this uh, novel so in this talk i will give you uh, like a try to sum it up into four uh, sections the first part is going to be the contextual understanding of the background in which sundri was written and it will have the uh, historical cultural and religious uh, backgrounds and then the second will be the literary background the second is uh, the translation part, which will be both lingual and conceptual translation. It's translations, and I have tried to actually, more I read about translations, more I was able to understand that translation is not only merely a carrying of message from one language to another language. It also involves uh, in a translation of the signs, the symbol, cultural understandings and all metaphysical aspects which go behind the words to connect the worlds in which we live in. So it involves a two kind of translation. One is the linguistic translation and the second one is most of a, a more of a conceptual understand conceptual translation which goes behind it. 
then there is a critical evaluation in post colonial studies about this novel which i will try to uh, sum it up in one slide and uh, the last uh, what we understand from sundriya sundriya as it is uh, in its uh, in its uh, native essence so the first thing is historical uh, religious and cultural background uh, when this novel was written this was the time of uh, uh, initiation of singh sabha reform movements in punjab too so historically it was uh, grounded in the time frames when uh, the singh sabha reform movement was taking place and the role of the print culture in reimagining sikhi was there so benedict anderson's uh, understanding of imagined communities is actually uh, uh, he has applied this concept how do we imagine a community how do we imagine ourselves as six how do we somebody imagines as hindu or how does a community imagines itself so th there is a definite role of the print culture which actually uh, takes those conceptions to the mass level so uh, so people can uh, uh, at a at a larger scale people can start imagining themselves as a one nation or one particular kind of community so this is how uh, the print culture always plays a definite role and uh, nowadays of course it's more of uh, internet and uh, other sources but uh, in, in this uh, uh, benedict anderson's understanding was basically uh, derived from European Renaissance period. So, how did the Europe's uh, 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 Europe started imagining itself into nations? So, in which the language, cultural, language, religion, and culture played an important role in order in making a community as an imagined community. So, it was also a time during this process when uh, there were hardening of religious boundaries. Ample amount of literature has been produced. and a lot of work has been done uh, on uh, on the hardening of the religious boundaries so which is basically a colonization a process of colonial uh, and discourses colonial understanding of religion which actually percolated into the native subjectivity and uh, the cultural degeneration was also at, at that point at its uh, epitome with the feudalization of sikh society in the post guru period so the by the time things were reform movements were occurring in at a cultural level there was uh, uh, the sikh understanding or the sikh doctrinal understanding had gone to gone a, a, a very a huge transformation so sikh doctrines were not uh, uh, too much practicable in those in the in the cultural environment of punjab and in especially in sikh uh, sikh practices so this feudalization as a process uh, especially with the uh, feudal lords getting uh, feudal sardars getting too much of power during the reign uh, during the uh, reign of maharaja ranjit singh so those that uh, that process in which the society was getting like and divided uh, divided into uh, uh, feudal lords and peasants was actually also a, a process which happened during the pa and uh, the post guru period so sikh gurdwaras uh, were um, had uh, misaligned uh, misalignment of the sikh institutions according to the sikh uh, doctrines was also uh, in in that uh, frame of a uh, time framework so you can imagine how the society at of punjab was actually uh, working during those circumstances and the when the colonizer came to punjab they brought a scientific temperament and the understanding and the principle of certainty started working behind it so uh, scientific temperament of the colonizer actually it was instrumental in constructing the natives of native sikh ethics so the ethics were redefined as well it's not just um, the religion was redefined the, the the further branches of the religious understandings was also sikh aesthetics were redefined sikh ethics were uh, because sikh rat maryada was codified after that uh, uh, after the singh sabha reform movement so there was a definite pattern in which this uh, you know, colonial period had an influence and uh, uh, during that point and also the religious understanding was at an intersection of traditional value systems and modernity so so you can see that there was a traditional value system going on coming from the guru period which was also uh, there but of course very dormant but as well as there was modernity which was entering into the sikh society 
during that phase. So this was a, uh, the the period overall was at a crossroads in which this uh, system, in the the religious understanding of uh, um, uh, of the Sikh society was also being getting shaped Sikh along with the Sikh imagination. So this was the historical background, and then we have the literary background on which the contextual shifts were happening in that period. So there was, if you look at the pre-colonial period, there was more of folk and the cultural literature, which was basically based on kissas, wars, and jangnamas. So this was the kind of literature which was produced before the colonial advent. And uh, there were limited religious religious uh, literature produced during the Maharaja Ranjit Singh's reign, and uh, not many known epics or poetic compositions or literature are available. Uh, of course, there are uh, certain uh, uh, Sikh literature was also produced during that time, which included Gur Bilas and Bansavli Namas, Suraj Prakash, as well as there, these are the few uh, renowned native works which were there during that time. But uh, with the advent of colonialism, there was a complete shift in the, in the way the literature was produced. There was more of, uh, more of novel writing, plays, autobiographies, memoirs, newspapers, and uh, Sikh epics, and uh, literature for women and children, etc. were introduced with the advent of colonialism. So we can see that, uh, the, as, as I mentioned, the, uh, uh, the concept of imagined communities by Benedict Anderson. Then the print culture actually started uh, with the establishment of the uh, first um, uh, press in Ludhiana, and after that, it, it, it uh, actually uh, catalyzed the way the print, uh, uh, the literature was more produced on the Western, uh, it took both the Western as well as the native ways of writing uh, uh, literature. And then there were conceptual debates which initiated during that period. So a lot of debates were happening in the Sikh uh, environment during that time and also among the other religious cultures as well. So what is translation? So this book is translated by uh, Professor Puran Singh. So what does translation do and what is the role of translation in this? So. As I mentioned earlier, this, there are two types of translation. One is the literary translation, and the other one is, I believe, a conceptual translation. So literary translation is, uh, translation is in continuity of the text, and it's life beyond the constraints of language, space, and time. This is the literary uh, you know, mean, uh, 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 use of translation. So when we uh, take a text from a Gurmukhi language and translate it into another language. It's also bringing that uh, it's um, bringing it into a new world, so new modes of modes of understanding, so new language, new people can understand. So this is how the literary translation actually goes beyond the language, space, and time. And translation adds to the fame of the work. As we translate a work from one language to another, so it, it, the Sikhs uh, should actually be taking uh, translation works more seriously in their coming uh, years because specifically when you have those uh, the world classics which are written in different languages, they can actually add to our knowledge systems as well as when we, when we translate into our uh, Gurmukhi language and we translate those works into and uh, into other, uh, 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 translate from the other languages. So it adds the value to the text and many times the original is discovered in a new light through translation. This is a very important uh, message that uh, I was getting when uh, I was reading about translation. Walter Benjamin has written a lot about it. So there are, uh, Professor Mandir has also written um, a few articles on translation. His, uh, is given a complete, very uh, uh, good detail on that. So it adds the value to the text, and many times the original is also discovered. Like if you uh, see the Sundri and by translation work done by Professor Puran Singh, we actually find that the translation has added more meaning to our understanding, especially in the Western environment, when we are actually uh, been here for quite some time. So it will make more sense in that uh, uh, with this translated work. 
So conceptual translation is also very important along with it. It's not just, as I said, it's not just the literary translation. So now conceptual translation, it involves the translation of signs, symbols, and metaphysical meanings is central to that, uh, to, to a translation. So it requires a seminal and intensive relationship with the text and its language. So more we get engaged with the text, more we try to understand the text. If there is an intensive relationship with the text and its language through translation. So when, when we want to uh, understand how the native experience means something into it, that's many times uh, it is through translation that we get to that uh, idea. And the representation of non-linguistic life is the, is the key hindrance in conceptual translation. So there is a linguistic life and there is also a non-linguistic life which is always attached to, uh, to, uh, to the words. Like for example, if I translate the word charan kamal in English, it will become like uh, lotus feet. Right? So the lotus feet means on, uh, is, is more of an object. And Charan Kamal has a more a symbolic meaning and more universal uh, uh, meanings which are attached with that. So those kind of words are also, when we translate from one language to another, we take those uh, non-linguistic meanings along with that which, have, which are uh, sometimes more important than just the, uh, the regular words. So there is addition and fixation of meaning in translation that many times is in a state of flux in the original. Sometimes the, you understand the text more through translation. So it's not, uh, uh, the translation gives us more meaning because at the, the author's uh, state of flux gets more uh, fixated while, while we translate the, uh, while, while we undertake translations. So what are the features of a good translation? Because Professor Puran Singh has done this translation, so we try to understand this. It complements the meanings and the intentions of the original. So whatever Pai Veer Singh is trying, trying to say, the Professor Puran Singh is actually complementing the meaning and the intentions of uh, Pai Veer Singh. It's, uh, it's uh, politically and ideologically neutral. So this is very key these days. It's a lot of work being done on translation and politics of translation. So uh, it's, for translation to carry out in its best form, it has to be politically and ideologically neutral. It does not uh, devalue or distort the conceptual base of original. So it should not uh, distort the conceptual understanding of the original. It remains sensible while uh, contributing to the growth of the language, idiom, expression, and knowledge. So this is very uh, uh, key in this translation too. Uh, so but it not only uh, we have other translations done by other uh, other uh, translators uh, on Sundri, but this one will you will find that it will add more to our understanding, more to our expressions, idioms, and our knowledge. And there is uh, the strangeness of language between two languages. There is always an element of strangeness <coughs> which continues to be there. It gets absorbed into the familiarity and the intimacy of the knowledge within the text. So when it becomes more intimate with us, so more personalized, so there is a strain, that strangeness of the knowledge gets uh, absorbed and the continuity of life into another text and its fulfillment in linguistic development of both languages. So translation helps in linguistic development of both languages, not just the original language but also the, the receiver language. So it's both ways if there's an inter interaction and more uh, and the translation can add another uh, uh, layer of uh, in linguistic development within the language itself. So it produces an echo of sensibility into translation. So there is an uh, echo you can hear of the native voice into the translated work if it is more, uh, more, uh, um, uh, more close to the, um, uh, to the original. So the original is more uh, getting more uh, meaning as through a, uh, can get more meaning through a translation too. 
However, there is also, this is the third part of uh, uh, my talk here, and uh, this is the critical evaluation in the closed colonial studies. So why is uh, five years things about, especially Sundari being more critically evaluated in the in, in, in post colonial studies? I try to understand the conceptual questions. Why is it getting there? Not just that, oh, uh, that it is there or giving some uh, kind of uh, what is the background of the authors? What, how, how does, how do people relate with the text? What, what is happening there? So there is, a, I feel there is a more focus on the ideological and the political undertones of the text. So there is an, a definite pattern of, uh, uh, of focusing more on identity politics, language politics, etc., et which is always there. So language and how is the self subjectified into a language? That's the key here. Uh, in, in the uh, uh, so we are, are as not just I, I would not say that word. Let me take that back. Any uh, community can get self-subjectified through uh, uh, ideological understanding and building up of consciousness into the political structures is very key in the uh, post-colonial studies of translation. And then there is a sociological evaluation with heavy concentration on solid dualism. So feminism, otherness, all these have an element of dualism in it. So you cannot, uh, what will be the same feminist subject when there is an absence of a masculine subject in it? It will have almost like no meaning uh, in, the, in, in modern ways of understanding. Of course, we can, the way the uh, feminism or the other similar, uh, the, sen the sense of otherness is developed, it's also very important in the sociological evaluation of the society. So then there is a concentration on ontotheology and, uh, and there is a Punjabi text. This is also considered to be Punjabi text. The scholars of Punjab studies have tried to fix it as a Punjabi text. It has a metaphysics in it, it has solid, it constructs solid religious boundaries. These are the common uh, um, common allegations, I would say, that uh, that go on Sundari or uh, um, in, in post-colonial and the critical evaluations of it. So it, it's, uh, it's like a binding of the cosmic self into the power structures. So what does cosmic self of Sundari mean? It gets binded into the power structures of time and space. That's how there is a concentration of onto theology in it. And then there is a selective choice of that data to foster a, a, a preset understanding of text. So the, many times the data is being ignored. So the only those those power type of that data is selected, which will actually uh, which can foster the preset con con connotations of the text. So this is how the critical evaluations in post colonial studies have uh, 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 <coughs> contributing in, in, uh, in the ways of uh, uh, approaching Sundari. There is a contribution too, because today if we look at ourselves, we are discussing Sundari in the university uh, setup, because there are critical evaluations that were done by the pa by the past and the scholars and say, so we have brought this has given us an opportunity to rediscover the same text from a universe uh, from a university setup so it, this has uh, uh, given us an, uh, a new way to look at sundri otherwise homes were the main space where it was uh, a, a sundri was primarily discussed prior to this so their conceptual translation uh, becomes a political project of evaluation and there is a focus on uh, sectarian meanings, subjectivity and imagination uh, through the critical evaluation. So, and the critical evaluations also foster an idea of, uh, uh, there is fostering an idea of puritanism, so like even though they are trying to uh, tease out from the uh, from the preset connotations of uh, ethnicity of Punjab, but like uh, Punjab as uh, Punjab studies scholars of uh, Punjab studies, they actually try to put uh, the text into uh, those uh, connotations. 
and this is not only happening in diasporic uh, uh, scholarship it's also sometimes happening even in the punjabi uh, societies as well so there's the punjab punjabi ethnicity and uh, uh, singing of punjab as an uh, uh, puritan land and puritan experience of a language of punjabi language it, uh, it somehow it's greater than the spiritual meaning of the text in uh, in, in, in sikh devotion so for the sect text actually has or the sikh inspiration or sikh spirituality carries more meaning in uh, in our uh, in our day, um, um, in our imagination so sundri as this is my last slide sundri as it is so why what's the uh, uh, and how do we approach sundri in the native meaning so the spiritual value of the text is greater than its ethnic value its linguistic value or the metaphysical ideas of identity this is this can be commonly found in this soon uh, so we need to focus on on these themes so this is what the experience of sindri becomes a living embodiment of uh, our native experiences so we can relate it through uh, on through and that's why it's more understandable in native imagination for common sex while the scholars continue to drive its meaning more from an ideological perspective that's when they continue to fix the uh, the the uh, text into an uh, into a metaphysical connotation while uh, common simple uh, living uh, sex they drive more uh, refreshing meaning from from this novel just because it has it has a greater spiritual experience which is embedded within the text so up it uplifts the flat consciousness into the inspired cosmic unity of spiritual consciousness through the namras tradition so namras tradition gets uh, uh, gets uh, enunciated through this text and it's inspired from the six sources this is very important because most of the times people think that this is it's a, it's a historical text some scholars think that it's a text of fiction and uh, some, uh, what what is the basic uh, um, uh, inspiration of uh, of sundri so it's uh, it's it drives some of its inspiration from the dasam granth which is uh, the source of the history myth making and upholding of dharma so that is very important uh, in, in the central to the dasam granth's uh, uh, understanding as well that we uh, the, uh, the, um, and the in that writings also you will find that there is a uh, upholding of that experience in this so the sakhi tradition is also getting imbibed into pai veer singh so pai veer singh since he is a, a, a writer of nayan namras tradition he has further uh, written gurunanak chamatkars and so he has that flavor and flair of actually relating with the sakhi so the sakhi tradition is uh, uh, central to this and that of especially of that mata sundari being blessed with the khalsa as the progeny so that is also getting uh, uh, so the people of uh, punjabi literature especially in punjab they uh, I, i have spoken with them a part number of times they always relate this sundri with mata sundri so it's usually uh, uh, which is a, a gap which is which diaspora communities usually don't uh, think that it can be related in that sense as well. so cosmic motherhood of mata sahib deva and the spiritual birth and the raising of khalsa and seva good prit ko apandi and god uh, ko has also mentioned about this so this is uh, uh, always there as, uh, in in uh, in the cosmic mother principle here so being in matter time transcends being in history so the being of the self is uh, uh, in in the in the matter time it transcends in the, the being in the history so uh, the uh, the the text is uh, explaining that to us and that death is central to the sikh experience in history so you can s- there are multiple ways we can relate with this so saw its death essentially even in the tradition of khalsa when the guru uh, is inviting uh, six to lay their life and uh, for to experience that similarly is the this the ideological background of the main protagonist sundri uh, uh, being uh, uh, 
uh, you know, in this uh, novel, uh, she lays down the life. So she is no more, so that uh, ideological culmination into some kind of metaphysical idea, it is actually, uh, Pai Veer Singh has actually absorbed it into the, into the death of Sundari, the, the central, uh, um, uh, central protagonist. So then Gurbani is uh, not history as the core of Sikha understanding. This is what Pai Veer Singh, uh, this is a quote from Pai Veer Singh. He thinks that uh, it's not history but Gurbani which is the source of Sikha understanding. So Abchal Vastu in history is to be found out. He, he, he always refers to, uh, to look for that Abchal Vastu. Abchal Vastu means that something which is unshakable within that. So what is that unshakable truth in the history with the two word, uh, that cannot be discovered only from the events in the history that has to be discovered from with the relationship of history with Guru Bhagavan. So that is why Sikh imagination does not consider the Sundri most only as a ideological or feminist or woman or it is, it is considering it into a spiritual experience and so we have the Gurdwara in, for uh, Sundari at Nashara uh, Gurdaspur. So this is the spiritual epitome of uh, beings living which gets uh, uh, enunciated in the form of Gurdwara at Gurdaspur. So that's the reason and uh, the, this is the reason that the scholars of uh, feminist studies and scholars of Western studies have not considered this uh, aspect, so they, uh, they try to continuously place it into ideological or historical framework. I think I tried to give a very quick sum up. Uh, thank you very much for that. Thank you so much. I think that was really enlightening and um, I appreciate your um, trying to consolidate your speech. Um, thank you so much for going over the literary, the translation, the critical evaluation, and then placing Sudri within um, the spiritual and the namorous tradition. I think that was really, really helpful. Um, it's really obvious from your speech that you um, engage really intimately with um, not probably the original text as well as with the translation. And I think you and her joke did a, um, a wonderful job of putting this together. So thank you again. I have the pleasure now of um, inviting you to have a tea break, but don't get too comfortable with the tea. We're back in our seat in six minutes, all right? Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Delambri Kay, who is Professor Singh's granddaughter. So it's a very kind of amazing opportunity. She's joining us from Ottawa on Zoom. She is a scholar of six studies, so we're really um, honored to have the opportunity to listen to her. So welcome, thank you. Canada, the Rajadhani, Ottawa, to Sarayanu, Miri, Niggi, the Pyar, Pari, Satsrika. थोड़ा जहाँ इधर विच गैप आ रहे हैं जो मैं बोल रही हूँ तो अभी तक पहुँच नहीं तो विच कोई कुछ सेकंड्स का फर्क पड़ रहा है सो मैं तो मैं हॉली हॉली पढ़ाली मेरी छोटी जी पेशकश है पेशकश है ज़्यादा लंबी नहीं है I would like to thank Professor Jagdish Singh at Nath Pragas, Dr. Jaswinder Singh, Dr. Ramandeep Singh,
Dr. Harjot Kaur, and everyone who helped in making it possible to publish and launch the English translation of Sai Veer Singh's Sundari. This has been a long process and one that has been very close to my heart. I am particularly grateful to Harjot Kaur and her team of researchers who have worked very hard to transform the manuscript form of Professor Purin Singh's translation into its current form that is now being launched. I want to emphasize the next sentence very clearly. I don't think there could have been a better and a more accomplished team to have done this. My fond and loving appreciation. A few quotes from Harjot Kaur's brilliant introduction. Sundari ruptures modern secular understanding of both history and fiction. It is neither complete history nor a total work of fiction. She describes how the book uplifts history from its inner obstacles. How it is witness to a living moment at every nodal point and how it reaches beyond socio-cultural boundaries. This introduction bridges the gap between the century that separates us from when Sundari was written. It makes us reflect on our collective past to equip us to move into a more inclusive and intuitive future. Events such as this launch and the publication of this book reconnect me with my ancestors. I am reminded of precious moments spent at both Doiwala, 12 miles, kilometers from um, Dehradun, a sprawling home to Professor Purin Singh's family where we spent our winter vacations, and Panchpati in Dehradun by Veer Singh's idyllic home. I am reminded of Maya Puran Singh, my grandmother, Dadi Ji, who was a role model of feminism from her inner being.
as Harjot Kaur described in her presentation this morning. Maya Puran Singh Maya Puran Singh knew nothing of feminism and learned everything from those around her. And I witnessed how she spread this Sundari-like dynamism among all the women she knew, including my mother. It will be amiss if I do not mention that there were three friends that shaped the thinking of these times. Hyveer Singh, Bhaiveer Singh, Professor Puran Singh, and Dr. Khudaga, a fellow scientist and kind soul who stayed behind who stayed forever behind the wings, supporting, sculpting, and measuring movements and ideas as they formed. It was an environment of what I would call lived secularism. I don't particularly enjoy preconceived, connotated terms. that become restrictive because of their isms. I will therefore ask you to use the same deconstruct for secularism that Harjot Kaur uses for feminism. I conclude con connecting our collective strength from those brave times to these and with a quote from Professor Puran Singh's essay, Bhai Taru Singh, A Sikh Farmer. I think the following sums up what most of the speakers have been referring to today in their presentations. It is interesting to note, however, that the quotation from Bhai Taru Singh was written over a hundred years ago. So I quote, history after all is a poor general record of the outward show and theatrical activity and does not keep any record of the silent life on the deeper levels of human society, which alone in all times has caused the greatest changes and revolutions on the surface of this earth. Hence, like other objects of this world, the visible body of history is only a small speck on the great invisible past. I conclude with, a, with an idiomatic, I use the word idiomatic like you have used in your presentations. Uh, a greeting always uh, used by my uh, uh, daddy ji for me. So, Rakha Saidiya, till we meet again. Thank you.
thank you so much. That was beautiful. Um, we really appreciate the heartfelt connection to your dadaji and to your family. Um, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and um, encouraging us with this book. Thank you so much for joining us. So I'm going to invite her, Joel Cora. I think you're going to be presenting. Um, so should I introduce? Yeah, I'm going to hand okay. over to. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing. Um, another celebrity in our midst, um, Dr. Kiran, uh, Dr. Komal Kiran Kordang. We're so excited to have you here. You are Pai Veer Singh's great granddaughter. So we just got to hear from Professor Buddhism's granddaughter, and now we get to hear from Pai Veer Singh's great granddaughter, for whom this whole day that we've been, you know, kind of talking about. She and her husband, uh, Sapal Singh Dang, have traveled from Baltimore, Maryland, to take part in this book um, release function. We're so grateful for you to make the journey, and um, and I had the pleasure of speaking to you for a moment um, at lunch, and I'm really, really touched by your devotion to your great grandfather's work and to your kind of carrying on that legacy. So welcome. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So sorry that it's going to be a little bit longer than I anticipated especially after lunchtime. And, but anyway, I guess the hot team has worked for all of us. So here we go. So other Nick Sad Sangaji by Kritika Khalsa by So today I'm going to speak on the passion, the personality, and the perspectives of my beloved Pitaji, Paisa Paisa Singhji. As you all know, he was a mystic poet a prose writer, a historian, a lexicographer, a savant, an exegete, a journalist, an expositor of Gurbani, a social and a religious reformer, and an advancer of modern education. Born on December the 5th, 1872, in Chong, Katara, Amritsar, in a very Gursik family of Jhang. His ancestors included, as you heard, Divan Koramal, People affectionately called him Divan Mithamal because of his service to his community, using his tact, his love for Sikhs and intelligence to change the course of action of the Mughal rulers towards the Sikhs. So Paivir Singh Ji's paternal grandfather, Pai Kaha Singh, was a man of piety and devotion and moved from Gad Maharaj Jhang district, Punjab, Pakistan to Amritsar in 1828. Dr. Charan Singh was his father, also a literary person, who rendered a translation of Shakuntla into, Punjab, into Punjabi and composed a book, Jhang Maroli, which testifies to his splendid gifts of soul and intellect. Jis which Ram Roop Kaur, Yani Avidya, Yamaya, they tikka manna singh, yani jeev ya man, they sangharsh da, they sthar hai. So Paiveer Singh ji told his father that instead of translations to write original books to which his father responded, I've left that on you. Paiveer Singh ji is um, 
maternal grandfather, as you heard, uh, was uh, Gyani Hazara Singh, who was a scholar of uh, Sanskrit, Persian, and Gurmukhi. He wrote the Guru Granth Sahib Kosh, which Paivir Singh Ji edited and completed. He also wrote a commentary on the works of Pai Gurdas Ji. So Paivir Singh Ji was nurtured in an environment of encouragement in literature and history. So his early surroundings were religious and intellectual. From boyhood onwards, he lived his life in great moral and spiritual heights. The poet in him is inseparable from the saint. He was a virtual genius. His aesthetic sense contained the ultimate truth of things, the genius of an artist and a historian which led to his gateway of metaphysical knowledge. So essentially, he brought about a renaissance in the religious, cultural, and the social life of Punjab, a history that was in decline when the British took over. Therefore, he was considered by the British as a dangerous man. He lived in an age of modern rationalism, which destroyed God in the name of humanity, and then destroyed humanity in the name of the state, and then destroyed the state in the name of welfare, and then the welfare state destroyed individual efforts that weakened moral fibers, paralyzing the individual rights of self-liberation. So this modern rationalization was entering into India when Pitaji took up the might of his thought and pen. The true love of humanity is the love of a free man in every man, he said. This modern rationalization was entering into India. When Pitaji took up the might of his thought and pen, he said that in man, the Param Purak has to be recognized and served. So Pitaji provided that renovation, the understanding that forms the basis of a higher experience. So this very humble man has spent all his energy, his soul, and lifetime in promoting the teachings of our gurus by using his dedication and journalistic power to bring out the best of Sikh values to lead an ideal life at a higher moral plane. So he contributed to the freedom movement of India from the British rule as well, and most importantly, bringing the Sikhs back to their language, literature, and pride. We are again being faced with conversions by Christians and Hindu preachers, but we are taught that Sikhs produce converts not by persuasion, force, or enticement, but merely by an example of their life and conduct, their lofty moral character, their personal touch, and with the writings of their guru's wisdom. So his uh, brother, Dr. Balbir Singh, wrote of him in quotes, if a man reveals what is concealed in his personality, he is a saint. If his personality begins to reflect in his art, he is a saint poet. And that was by Veer Singh Ji. So just to name a few of his long list of works, which I think most of you all know anyway, is Pai Nod Singh, Vijay Singh, Satwan Kaur, Bandagi Lera, Dehar, Matak Pulare, Mere Sanya Jiyo, Vijiliya Dehar, Kamdi Kalai, Guru Nanak Chamatka, Sri Kalkita Chamatka, Rashtkur Chamatka, Jabji, Sarg, uh, Steek, Guru Granth Sahib Kosh, etc., etc. Uh, most importantly, his seven volumes, Santhya, which was left incomplete due to his Akal Chalana, but was later completed by his brother, Dr. Balbir Singh. Social societies and reforms that he actively promoted were the Khalsa University and the Khalsa School in the making of an orphanage, a school for the blind, Punjab and Sindh Bank, home for the aged in Tarantaran Sai. He part part participated actively in the Singh Sabha movement and organization of the Chief Khalsa Divan. He started the first Wazir Hind Press in Amritsar, and thus the newspaper Khalsa Samachar. 
He was nominated in the Upper House of Punjab Literature Seatment for Literary People. He was a mentor of, he was a member of the Sahitya Academy. So in 1956, he was awarded the Padma Bhushan Award. Yet with all this recognition and persuasive influence, he wanted to live a life of obscurity and continue his mission. His passion was to write, 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 and make a change. He hated the glare of publicity and recognition. This is evidenced in his not even acknowledging his name as an author of his books, which was later written in by the publishers. One of his poems on the violet flower translated depicts his nature. He says in quotes, I am like a violet who remains concealed in his own foliage. I wish to live unnoticed and die unlamented Alas, it is my fragrance that betrays my existence, unquote. His modesty and his humility were fundamental and constitutional within him. He said, desire for name and fame generates self-conceit and the conceit hardens the ego. The hard core of the ego is a hindrance to the spiritual progress. So he seldom spoke from a platform but his presence, his conversation, and aura had a magnetic effect in those in contact with him. People were just awestruck in his presence. So we have discussed a bit about his work and personality as a humanist and a philanthropist to uplift the Sikh community. So inspired by the zeal of the great gurus, his encouragement from childhood came from his Elders, his seeing four of his Christian missionary school missionaries, Christian missionary school six students almost convert to Christianity and many more. And his philanthropic work humanized his soul, lifted it above worldly thoughts to be imbibed into higher aspirations, where he achieved the sublimation of the self, leading to divinization. But his mysticism involved a personal spiritual experience born of a travail in the deepest depth of consciousness, a silent meditation and self-surrender. This has been depicted in all his prose works, starting with Sundari, published in 1898, which was, has a poetic flavor to it. In the preface of Sundari, Paivir Singhji says, our purpose, in quotes, our purpose for writing this book is that the Sikhs, after reading the great adventures of the past, may become firm in their faith, may carry the duties of worshipping God, and thus executing the worldly responsibilities. The evils may be eradicated by creating loftiness of character in these days of moral promiscuity, unquote. After a fallen Sikh empire in Punjab, the community became decadent, disintegrated, frustrated, and demoralized. That it seemed to have lost its moorings brought about the British rule. So he wanted to revive the Sikh character of selfless service, fearlessness, and sacrifice by laying stress on the teachings of our gurus and depicting the heroic deeds of our Sikh martyrs who laid down their lives for religious, religious and political freedom. This first novel, Sundari, written at a tender age of 26, conveyed this message and had an emotional and inspiring effect on the readers. Sundari depicts Sikh history and a Sikh philosophy in an ideal and devotional manner. The main character Sundari is portrayed as you know, as a benevolent, brave, courageous, ideal Sikh warrior. And the presented male Sikhs as well, as the defenders of the honor of not only its, its own women, but in fact, all women in general. The central theme of the story occurs in the 18th century Punjab when the Sikhs were trying to consolidate themselves in difficult conditions during the time of the alleged 
Mughal persecution of the Sikhs of the, during the time of the Chordakal Lugara. In Sundari, a band of Sikhs leading by Sham Singh became a guardian of Sundari after she was saved from conversion and marriage to a Muslim Nawab. So it's a description of a Sikh movement. He describes the lofty moral character of the Sikhs of old times, their adherence to the religious ideas of Naam Japna and Amrit Chakna, and scenes of mutual help and an infinite capacity to bear untold suffering and pain and hunger at the hand of their adversaries. This construction of gender and religious identities is what aroused the younger Sikh generation into piety and sacrifice. As a result of these intense thoughts and writings, the Sikhs of our movement and the Khalsa Divan became stronger, working towards an ideal goal. So a few years into the publication of Sundari, several Sikhs returned to taking Amrit, a fallen Sikh empire, once again stood in pride. In his poem, Love and Wisdom Told by a Nightingale and a Bear Fair, reveals this patriotism and love for freedom. He says, in quotes, who knows the state of an imprisoned soul where freedom is in the will of another? Better death than loss of freedom of living. If freedom departs from the soul, it is better that life should cease forever. Men have fought and they fight still for freedom's sake. Great are those who lose their lives to be free or to set free." Unquotes. So all these adages just fit into the message of Sundari, a simple plot and action that shows a miraculous courage of the trouble six explaining the meaning of human life and sacrifice. So the six, despite facing these tribulations and hardships, kept a smiling face, kept their balance of mind and lived in high spirits, what we call Chadvikala. So how does this consciousness of the immortality of his love for the Guru's name, Sangat, and nature convey this, his delicate flower-like touch beneath his greatness, pride, and love for promoting Sikh history and literature. Paivir Singh Ji has rooted references in historical of historical relevance. This is what we need to be continued in our young generation today. So the big question is, what do we do now? Each one of us individually, and as a community. So you need to find your role model, explore the arts, be it history, literature, religion, expressive music, or other fine artwork. Find your niche in these very important pathways leading to a fulfilling life of Sikhism. Pursue PhDs in these subjects, but also if you have chosen another primary profession, Bring these back into your lives like Hajot Kaur and Amandeep Singh have. Believe that you can make a difference by being a drop in that ocean. Be that change and the small things will be big things. It doesn't matter who you are and where you come from. The ability to triumph begins with you always. It is my great pleasure to be amongst this very highly educated group of people. All the speakers today have motivated us with their passion and their critical thinking. I'm deeply grateful to them for shedding light in this very important topic. Engaging in history, art, and literature is essential to the human experience and the health of a civil community. So we need more students in history, literature, and other arts, writing more literature, to bring a revolution establishing sick thought and ideals in the literary circles, to increase moral understanding and cultural awareness, carrying out research, developing persuasive arguments and writings. So about a week ago, I had the pleasure of meeting two young Gursik PhD candidates in religious studies from the University of California, Riverside, who are only in their late 20s. 
and who gave very inspiring speeches at a seminar of Pai Veer Singh Ji that we held in Washington, D.C. It made me extremely happy to see this direction taken by our children, indeed very motivating for our future. Once again, I say that hopefully more of you will consider this path. So when my daughter Amrita Kaur told us that she wanted to pursue a college major in music technology in Oberlin College, we were disappointed. But with her zeal and persistence for her passion in that art and music can make a difference in the world, we accepted it initially with hesitancy, of course, but subsequently encouraged her and today feel proud of her decisions and achievements she discovered that Pitaji also had a deep knowledge of classical Gurmat music. So she managed to get a grant locally to make an album on some of his poetry and music from Kamdi Kalai and other, and she has begun to work on that. So we need more Sikh scholars to work on his biography. So introducing him spiritually, a research magazine, even if it is quarterly, to understand that Shabad in him. So the four points that I'm encouraging today for the young people would be to focus on Sikh hermeneutics, Sikh aesthetics, Sikh historiography, and the importance of sadhana in Sikh epistemology. So today my ardas is to encourage all to pursue this and become the seventh river of Punjab literature to continue the tradition that Pai Veer Singh Ji started in 1889. That tradition um, uh, needs to be continued. So I will end with a small personal anecdote that I had with him. So one morning at 5 a.m. at the age of seven and a half years, when he took me on his daily morning walk in his huge garden, holding my little hand, I asked Pitaji, Pitaji, you keep remembering my Guruji all the time, but where is he? I don't see him. He said, come my dear, I'll tell you. So after taking a few steps, he asked me, if I experienced a fragrance. And I immediately answered, it's the fragrance of roses. Pitaji says, do you see it? Me, no. We walk a bit more and he asked, do you hear something? Me, yes, it's the song of the coil bird. Pitaji, do you see it? Me, no. As we walk on, Pitaji turns to me again and asks, do you feel the cool air? I answer, it's a nice cool breeze. Pitaji, what do you see around you and how? Me, a garden full of flowers and trees, the lychee trees, the mango trees, the jackfruit trees, the grass, and of course, it's the light. Pitaji, do you see the light? Me, no. Pitaji, that's just it. God is a sublime experience all around you, and that's how you see Vaheguru. I still didn't understand it till years later. And this was my Pitaji, my Guruji Ka Khalsa. Thank you so much. That was like an amazing experience. It was um, a trip down memory lane. It was bringing Paisa by Singh to life for us. It was giving us a, um, a call you. to action. So we have to think, please stay up here. We have something to present to you, I believe, right? So yes, please join us. I think I'm gonna call her Jyot Kaur up. Thank you again, it was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. You have Thank you. Thank you so much. It's great. Now, I, it's, I don't have my schedule in front of me. It's, I think, I believe I'm in, to invite Dr. Mandera up to speak. Is that correct? I think we could go to the Oh, oh Professor Jigby Singh, okay. Um, I'd like to invite Professor Jigby Singh up from Nath Prakas. He's going to be giving us some remarks. Yeah.
ਸਰ ਪੂਰਨ ਸਿੰਘ ਦੋਹਾਂ ਦਾ ਇੱਕ ਰਾਈਟਿੰਗ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਮੇਲ ਹੋਇਆ ਉਸ ਮੇਲ ਨੂੰ ਸੈਲੀਬ੍ਰੇਟ ਕੀਤਾ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਪ੍ਰੋਫੈਸਰ ਪੂਰਨ ਸਿੰਘ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਆ ਉਹ ਭਾਈ ਵੀਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਦੇ ਐਕਸਪੀਰੀਅੰਸ ਤੇ ਹੀ ਮਿਸਟਿਕਲ ਕ੍ਰੀਏਟਿਵ ਐਕਸਟੈਂਸ਼ਨ ਹਨ ਤੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਸਿਮਰਨ ਨੂੰ ਉਹ ਕਲਚਰ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਗਾਉਂਦੇ ਹਨ ਕਲਚਰ ਦੀਆਂ ਵੇਰੀਏਸ਼ਨਸ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਅਸਥੈਟਿਸਾਈਜ਼ ਕਰਦੇ ਹਨ ਸੋ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਆਪਣੀ ਮੌਲਿਕਤਾ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਭਾਈ ਵੀਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਦੇ ਰਾਹੀਂ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਕੋਈ ਸਪਿਰਚੁਅਲ ਅਨੁਭਵ ਹੈ ਉਸ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚੋਂ ਹੀ ਆਪਣੀ ਜ਼ਿੰਦਗੀ ਦਾ 뮤직 ਜਿਹੜਾ ਅਕਸ ਕਰਦੀ ਹੈ ਤੇ ਹਰ ਇੱਕ ਸਕਾਲਰ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਹੈ ਤੇ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਇੱਕ ਐਸਥੈਟੀਸ਼ੀਅਨ ਹੈ ਉਹਦੇ ਮੈਟਰ ਦੀ ਪ੍ਰਾਈਮੇਸੀ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਰਹਿ ਕੇ ਹੀ ਸਪਿਰਚੁਅਲ ਵਰਲਡ ਨੂੰ ਪਾਉਣਾ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਹੈ ਇਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਮੈਟਰ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਡੁਐਲਿਟੀ ਹੈ ਜਾਂ ਕੰਟਰਡਿਕਸ਼ਨਸ ਹੈ ਜਾਂ ਅਧੂਰਾਪਣ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਅਧੂਰਾਪਣ ਕਿਸੇ ਟਰਾਂਸਸੈਂਡੈਂਟਲ ਨਿਯਮ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਮਰਜ ਹੋ ਕੇ ਹੀ ਉਸ ਅਧੂਰੇਪਣ ਦੀ ਅਥੈਂਟਿਸਿਟੀ ਨੂੰ ਗ੍ਰਹਿਣ ਕਰਦਾ ਹੈ ਨਹੀਂ ਤਾਂ ਉਹ ਲੋਅਰ ਰੈਲਮ ਦੀ ਸਾਈਕੋਲੋਜੀ ਦੇ ਫੀਅਰਸ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਗਲਤਾਨ ਹੋ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਪੂਰਨ ਸਿੰਘ ਨੇ ਆਪਣੀ ਅਸਥੈਟਿਕ ਅਪਰੋਚ ਨੂੰ ਤੇ ਉਹਦੀ ਮਟੀਰੀਅਲਿਟੀ ਨੂੰ ਫੀਅਰ ਦੀ ਬਜਾਏ ਉਸਨੇ ਭਾਈ ਵੀਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਦੀ ਸਪਿਰਚੁਅਲਿਟੀ ਨਾਲ ਇੱਕ ਟਰਾਂਸਸੈਂਡੈਂਟਲ ਰੈਲਮ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਰੱਖਦੇ ਹੋਏ ਇੱਕ ਫਰੈਸ਼ਨੈਸਨੈਸ ਤੇ ਇੱਕ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਫੁੱਲ ਵਰਗੀ ਮਹਿਕ ਤੇ ਖੰਭ ਵਰਗੀ ਉਡਾਰੀ ਰੱਖੀ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਨਹੀਂ ਤੇ ਮਨੁੱਖੀ ਮਨ ਦੇ ਅੰਦਰ ਕਾਲ ਦੀਆਂ ਚੀਜ਼ਾਂ ਦੇ ਟਾਈਮ ਦੀਆਂ ਚੀਜ਼ਾਂ ਦਾ ਬੁਝਲਪਣ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਰਹਿੰਦਾ ਹੈ ਤੇ ਉਹਦੀਆਂ ਕੰਟਰਡਿਕਸ਼ਨਸ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਰਾਈਟਿੰਗ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਰਹਿੰਦੀਆਂ ਤੇ ਰਾਈਟਿੰਗ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਹਿਊਮਨ ਹਿਊਮਨ ਰੈਲਮ ਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਕੰਟਰਡਿਕਸ਼ਨਸ ਨੂੰ ਰੈਲੇਟਿਵਲੀ ਬੈਟਰ ਪੋਜੀਸ਼ਨ ਲੱਭਣ ਲਈ ਪੇਸ਼ ਕਰਦੇ ਹੋਏ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਡਰਾਮਟਾਈਜ਼ ਕਰਦੀ ਰਹਿੰਦੀ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਪੂਰਨ ਸਿੰਘ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਹੈ ਉਹਦੀ ਰਾਈਟਿੰਗ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਆ ਭਾਈ ਵੀਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਕਰਕੇ ਇਸ ਚੀਜ਼ ਤੋਂ ਮਤਲਬ ਇਸ ਰੈਲਮ ਤੋਂ ਉੱਪਰ ਰਹੀ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਇਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਅੱਜ ਬੜੀ ਖੁਸ਼ੀ ਲੈ ਰਹੇ ਹਾਂ ਕਿ ਇਹ ਦੋ ਰਾਈਟਰ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਆ ਉਹ ਇੱਕ ਟੈਕਸਟ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਅਸੀਂ ਇਕੱਠੇ ਦੇਖੇ ਤੇ ਦੋ ਪਰਿਵਾਰ ਵੀ ਅਸੀਂ ਇੱਕ ਫੰਕਸ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇਕੱਠੇ ਦੇਖੇ ਪ੍ਰੋਫੈਸਰ ਪੂਰਨ ਸਿੰਘ ਦੀ ਫੈਮਿਲੀ ਚੋਂ ਸਾਡੇ ਨਾਲ ਨਿਲੰਬਰੀ ਕਈ ਜੀ ਸ਼ਾਮਲ ਹਨ ਤੇ ਕੋਮਲ ਡਾਂਗ ਜੀ ਸਾਡੇ ਨਾਲ ਸ਼ਾਮਲ ਹਨ ਤੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਪਰਿਵਾਰ ਸ਼ਾਮਲ ਹੈ ਤੇ ਭਾਈ ਵੀਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਜੀ ਦੇ ਖਾਨਦਾਨ ਨਾਲ ਸੋ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਮੈਂ ਅਸਥੈਟੀਸ਼ੀਅਨ ਦੇ ਨੁਕਤੇ ਤੋਂ ਵੀ ਗੱਲ ਰੱਖਣੀ ਚਾਹਨਾ ਹਾਂ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਮਟੀਰੀਅਲਿਟੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਆ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਰਿਫਾਈਂਡ ਕਰਨਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਬੜਾ ਉਹਦਾ ਇੱਕ ਮਕਸਦ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਇਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਸਾਡੇ ਸਪਿਰਚੁਅਲ ਅਨੁਭਵ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚੋਂ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਫਲਸਫਾ ਨਿਕਲਿਆ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਅਸੀਂ ਦਰਸ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਰਿਲੇਟ ਕੀਤਾ ਸੋ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਮਟੀਰੀਅਲਿਟੀ ਰਹਿੰਦੀ ਹੈ ਦਰਸ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਸੋ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਅਸੀਂ ਸੈਮੀਨਾਰ ਵੀ ਕਰ ਰਹੇ ਹਾਂ ਇਹ ਸੈਮੀਨਾਰ ਦਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਸਿੱਖ ਐਕਸਪੀਰੀਅੰਸ ਬਣਦਾ ਆ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਵੀ ਇਹ ਦਰਸ਼ਨ ਦੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਫਲੇਵਰ ਭਰ ਰਿਹਾ ਉਹ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਪ੍ਰੈਜ਼ੈਂਸ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਆ
ਸੋ ਉਹਦੀ ਗ੍ਰੈਵੀਟੇਸ਼ਨਲ ਪੁੱਲ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਆ ਉਹ ਹੈਲ ਵੱਲ ਨਹੀਂ ਖਿੱਚਦੀ ਉਹ ਫਾਲ ਵੱਲ ਨਹੀਂ ਖਿੱਚਦੀ ਉਹ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਵਿੰਗਸ ਦਿੰਦਾ ਆ ਤੇ ਉਹਦੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਰਸ ਹਨ ਉਹ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਆ ਉਹ ਪੋਲਿਊਟ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੁੰਦੇ ਉਹ ਇਹੋ ਜਿਹਾ ਫਲ ਫੁੱਲ ਖਿੜਦਾ ਆ ਕਿ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਸਦੀਵੀ ਰਸਾਂ ਦਾ ਭਰਿਆ ਹੋਇਆ ਆ ਉਹ ਸਮੇਂ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਆ ਉਹ ਉਹਦਾ ਨਿਦ ਰਸ ਹੀ ਧਰਤੀ ਦਾ ਧਰਤੀ ਨੂੰ ਗਾਲ ਦਿੰਦਾ ਆ ਸੋ ਇਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਇਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਦੀ ਚੀਜ਼ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਆ ਅੱਜ ਦੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਫੰਕਸ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਫੀਲ ਕਰ ਰਹੇ ਹਾਂ ਸੋ ਮੇਰਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਮਕਸਦ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਤਾਂ ਲੈਕਚਰ ਦੇਣਾ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੈ ਮੇਰਾ ਮਕਸਦ ਧੰਨਵਾਦ ਕਰਨਾ ਹੈ ਪਰ ਮੈਂ ਥੋੜੀ ਜੀ ਖੁੱਲ ਲੈ ਕੇ ਇੱਕ ਨੁਕਤਾ ਜਾਂ ਦੋ ਨੁਕਤੇ ਕਹਿਣਾ ਚਾਹਣਾ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਮੇਰਾ ਮਤਲਬ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਵਕਵਕ ਪੇਪਰਸ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਚੀਜ਼ ਆਈ ਕਿ ਰੀਕੰਟੈਕਚੁਲਾਈਜ਼ ਕੀਤਾ ਜਾਵੇ ਤੇ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਕਲੋਨੀਅਲ ਸਟੱਡੀਜ਼ ਹੋਈਆਂ ਜਾਂ ਜਿਵੇਂ ਭੂਮਿਕਾ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਵੀ ਕਿਹਾ ਕਿ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਹਿਸਟਰੀ ਤੇ ਫੈਮਿਨਿਜ਼ਮ ਦੇ ਨੁਕਤੇ ਤੋਂ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਚੀਜ਼ਾਂ ਦੇ ਰਾਹੀਂ ਭਾਈ ਵੀਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਦੇ ਇਸ ਟੈਕਸਟ ਨੂੰ ਇੱਕ ਖਾਸ ਕੰਟੈਕਸਟ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਪੇਸ਼ ਕੀਤਾ ਗਿਆ ਸੋ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਰੀਕੰਟੈਕਚੁਲਾਈਜ਼ ਕਿਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਕੀਤਾ ਜਾਵੇ ਸੋ ਮੈਂ ਇਸ ਚੀਜ਼ ਤੇ ਤਾਂ ਨਹੀਂ ਬੋਲਾਂਗਾ ਪਰ ਮੈਂ ਇਹ ਬੋਲਾਂਗਾ ਕਿ ਰੀਕੰਟੈਕਚੁਲਾਈਜ਼ੇਸ਼ਨ ਦਾ ਪ੍ਰੋਸੈਸ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਆ ਇਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਚੈਲੰਜਸ ਪੈਦਾ ਹੁੰਦੇ ਹਨ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਚੈਲੰਜਸ ਦਾ ਡਿਵਾਈਨ ਨੇਮ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਕੀ ਪੋਜੀਸ਼ਨ ਹੁੰਦੀ ਹੈ ਇਹ ਦੇਖਣਾ ਵੀ ਇੱਕ ਬੜੀ ਜ਼ਰੂਰੀ ਗੱਲ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਉਹਦੇ ਲਈ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਇਹ ਦੇਖਣਾ ਪਏਗਾ ਕਿ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਚੇਂਜ ਦਾ ਕੁਐਸਚਨ ਕੀ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਚੇਂਜ ਵਾਪਰਦੀ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਕਿਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਵਾਪਰਦੀ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਸ਼ਬਦ ਐਕਸਪੀਰੀਅੰਸ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਮਲਟੀਪਲ ਰੈਲਮਸ ਹਨ ਕੌਨਸ਼ੀਅਸਨੈਸ ਦੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਆਥੈਂਟਿਕ ਡੁਐਲਿਟੀ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹਨੂੰ ਭੂਮਿਕਾ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਅਨੁਭਵੀ ਦੁਪਖਤਾ ਕਿਹਾ ਗਿਆ ਆ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਕਨਵਰਟ ਕਰ ਲਿਆ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਆ ਸੋ ਅਨੁਭਵੀ ਦੁਪਖਤਾ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਲੋਅਰ ਟਾਈਮ ਆ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਕਾਲ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਸਮਾਂ ਆ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਚੇਤਨਾ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਆ ਉਹ ਰਿਜੈਕਸ਼ਨ ਦਾ ਪ੍ਰਿੰਸੀਪਲ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਆ ਉਹ ਆਪਣੀ ਕ੍ਰੀਏਟਿਵਿਟੀ ਚ ਐਕਸੈਪਟ ਕਰਦੀ ਆ ਇਹ ਨੁਕਤਾ ਬਹੁਤ ਖਾਸ ਨੁਕਤਾ ਹੈ ਸ਼ਬਦ ਟ੍ਰੈਡੀਸ਼ਨ ਦਾ ਕਿ ਲੋਅਰ ਟਾਈਮ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਆਪਣੇ ਸਬਲਾਈਮ ਪਹਿਲੂਆਂ ਦੇ ਸਾਬਤ ਰੂਪਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਬਰਕਰਾਰ ਰੱਖਦੇ ਹੋਏ ਲੋਅਰ ਟਾਈਮ ਦੇ ਕਨੈਕਸ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਆਪਣੀ ਪ੍ਰੈਜ਼ੈਂਸ ਨੂੰ ਆਪਣੀ ਮਟੀਰੀਅਲਿਟੀ ਨੂੰ ਆਪਣੀ ਆਈਡੀਓਲੋਜੀ ਨੂੰ ਤੇ ਆਪਣੀਆਂ ਪੋਜ਼ਿਟਿਵ ਐਥੀਕਲ ਇਨਸਪੀਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਦੀਆਂ ਪੋਜੀਸ਼ਨਸ ਨੂੰ ਰਿਜੈਕਟ ਕਰਨ ਦੇ ਪ੍ਰੋਸੈਸ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਢਾਲ ਲਿਆ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਆ ਤੇ ਉਸ ਰਿਜੈਕਸ਼ਨ ਦੀ 뮤ਜ਼ਿਕੈਲਿਟੀ ਨੂੰ ਹਾਇਰ ਰੈਲਮ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਇੰਟਿਊਨ ਕਰ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਇਹਦਾ ਅਜੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਕੋਈ ਸਟਰਕਚਰ ਨਹੀਂ ਬਣਾ ਸਕੇ ਸ਼ਬਦ ਫਿਲਾਸਫੀ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚੋਂ ਅਮਨਦੀਪ ਨੇ ਭੂਮਿਕਾ ਚ ਇਹ ਕਿਹਾ ਹੈ ਆਪਣੇ ਲੈਕਚਰ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਕਿ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਏਲੀਅਨ ਪਰਸਪੈਕਟਿਵਸ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚੋਂ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਕੁਐਸਚਨਸ ਪੈਦਾ ਹੋਏ ਉਹਦੇ ਕਰਕੇ ਹੀ ਅਸੀਂ ਅੱਜ ਦੇ ਸੈਮੀਨਾਰ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਪ੍ਰੈਜ਼ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਉਹਦੀ ਪੋਜ਼ਿਟਿਵ ਕੰਟਰੀਬਿਊਸ਼ਨ ਨੂੰ ਹਾਜ਼ਰੀ ਲਵਾਉਣ ਦੀ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਕੀਤੀ ਮੈਂ ਉਸ ਪੋਜ਼ਿਟਿਵ ਪੋਜੀਸ਼ਨ ਨੂੰ ਇੱਕ ਕਾਸਮਿਕ ਸ਼ਬਦ ਦੇ ਕਾਸਮਿਕ ਨਿਯਮ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਉਹਦੀ ਪੋਜੀਸ਼ਨ ਬਣਾਉਣ ਦੀ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਕਰ ਰਿਹਾ ਕਿ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਹਾਇਰ ਰੈਲਮ ਆ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਉਹਦੀ ਸਦੀਵਤਾ ਪਈ ਰਹਿੰਦੀ ਹੈ ਲੋਅਰ ਰੈਲਮ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਉਹ ਆਪਣੀ ਰਿਜੈਕਸ਼ਨ ਨੂੰ ਪਰਮਿਟ ਕਰਦਾ ਹੈ ਤੇ ਉਸ ਪੋਜੀਸ਼ਨ ਨੂੰ 
ਕੁਝ ਥੋੜਾ ਜਿਹਾ ਮੈਂ ਅਜੇ ਇਹ ਵੀ ਮੰਨਣ ਚ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਕੋਈ ਹਰਜ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਿ ਮੈਂ ਇਹਨੂੰ ਆਪ ਅਜੇ ਥੋੜਾ ਹੋਰ ਤਰਾਸ਼ ਰਿਹਾ ਆ ਅਜੇ ਸਾਰੀਆਂ ਸਾਈਡਸ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਲੱਗਦਾ ਕਿ ਅਜੇ ਇੱਥੇ ਕੰਮ ਕਰਨ ਵਾਲਾ ਪੂਰੇ ਕੁਝ ਕੁਝ ਧੁੰਦਲਾਪਣ ਵੀ ਸ਼ਾਇਦ ਮੈਂ ਕਰੂ ਇਹ ਕਰ ਰਿਹਾ ਹਾਂ ਪਰ ਇਹ ਇੱਕ ਬੁਨਿਆਦੀ ਨੁਕਤਾ ਹੈ ਦੂਜਾ ਨੁਕਤਾ ਇਹ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਭਾਈ ਵੀਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਜਿਵੇਂ ਕਿ ਭਾਈ ਵੀਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਨੇ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਕਲੋਨੀਅਲਿਜ਼ਮ ਦੁਆਰਾ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਚੀਜ਼ਾਂ ਤਿੰਨ ਚਾਰ ਚੀਜ਼ਾਂ ਮੇਨ ਸੀ ਇੱਕ ਹਿਸਟੋਰੀਸਿਜ਼ਮ ਸੀਗਾ ਦੂਜਾ ਰੈਸ਼ਨੈਲਿਟੀ ਸੀਗਾ ਤੀਜਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਨੋਵਲ ਆ ਨੋਵਲ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਆ ਇਹ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਨੋਵਲ ਆਇਆ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਮਤਲਬ ਵੈਸਟਰਨ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਨੋਵਲ ਦਾ ਸਟਰਕਚਰ ਸੀ ਉਹਦੀ ਉਹਦਾ ਮਤਲਬ ਕਿ ਮਿਮਟਿਕ ਐਲੀਮੈਂਟ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਉਹ ਚੱਲ ਰਿਹਾ ਸੀਗਾ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਉਸੇ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਮਿਮਿਕ ਕੀਤਾ ਜਾ ਰਿਹਾ ਸੀਗਾ ਤੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਕ੍ਰਿਟਿਕਸ ਸੀਗੇ ਉਹ ਵੈਸਟਰਨ ਨੋਵਲ ਦੇ ਸਟਰਕਚਰ ਤੋਂ ਹੀ ਉਸ ਨੂੰ ਐਨਾਲਿਸਿਸ ਕਰ ਰਹੇ ਸੀ ਸੋ ਮੈਂ ਇਸ ਗੈਦਰਿੰਗ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇਹ ਸੁਜੈਸ਼ਨ ਦੇਣਾ ਚਾਹਾਂਗਾ ਕਿ ਫੋਰਮ ਦੇ ਨੁਕਤੇ ਤੋਂ ਵੀ ਇਸ ਰਚਨਾ ਨੂੰ ਦੇਖਣਾ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਹੈ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਭਾਈ ਵੀਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਨੇ ਜਿਵੇਂ ਹਰਮਨਿਊਟਿਕਸ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਵੇਂ ਡਾਂਗ ਜੀ ਨੇ ਦੱਸਿਆ ਕਿ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਗੁਰੂ ਗ੍ਰੰਥ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਦੇ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਸੰਥਿਆ ਲਿਖੀ ਉਹਦੇ ਸੰਥਿਆ ਦਾ ਇੱਕ ਪਾਰਟ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਮੀਨਿੰਗ ਕੰਸਟਰਕਸ਼ਨ ਜੇ ਮੰਨਿਆ ਸਾਧਨਾ ਕਿ ਕੱਲੀ ਰੈਸ਼ਨੈਲਿਟੀ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਕੱਲੇ ਕਨਸੈਪਚੁਅਲ ਫਰੇਮ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਉਹਦਾ ਮੀਨਿੰਗ ਨਹੀਂ ਐਕਸਪਲੋਰ ਕੀਤਾ ਜਾ ਸਕਦਾ ਉਹਦੇ ਚ ਸਾਧਨਾ ਦਾ ਵੀ ਐਲੀਮੈਂਟ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਹੈ ਉਂਜ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਭਾਈ ਵੀਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਨਾਮ ਪ੍ਰਾਈਮੇਸੀ ਦੇ ਰਾਈਟਰ ਹਨ ਉਹ ਸ਼ਬਦ ਕੋਸਮੀਸਿਟੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਆ ਉਹਦੇ ਚ ਨਾਮ ਪ੍ਰਾਈਮੇਸੀ ਨੂੰ ਰੱਖ ਰਹੇ ਹਨ ਸੋ ਸ਼ਬਦ ਕੋਸਮੀਸਿਟੀ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਉਂਜ ਸਾਊਂਡ ਦੀਆਂ ਡਾਇਮੈਂਸ਼ਨਸ ਵੀ ਸ਼ਾਮਲ ਹੋਣੀਆਂ ਚਾਹੀਦੀਆਂ ਹਨ ਜਿਵੇਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਕਿਹਾ ਚਰਨ ਕਮਲ ਤੇ ਲੋਟਸ ਫੀਟ ਸੋ ਚਰਨ ਕਮਲ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਚਰਨ ਦਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਐਕਸਪੀਰੀਅੰਸ ਆ ਇਹ ਮੀਨਿੰਗ ਚ ਨਹੀਂ ਆਉਂਦਾ ਸੋ ਸਾਊਂਡ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਆ ਸਾਡੀਆਂ ਸੈਂਸਸ ਨੂੰ ਕੀ ਕਰਦੀਆਂ ਆ ਸਾਊਂਡ ਦੇ ਆਪਣੇ ਪਸਾਰ ਕੀ ਹਨ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀਆਂ ਸਾਡੀ ਬਾਇਓਕੈਮਿਸਟਰੀ ਨਾਲ ਸਾਡੀ ਸਾਈਕੋਲੋਜੀ ਨੂੰ ਬਦਲਣ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹਨੂੰ ਮੰਤਰ ਟ੍ਰੈਡੀਸ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਵੀ ਅਸੀਂ ਵਰਤ ਸਕਦੇ ਆ ਕਿ ਉਹਦਾ ਕੀ ਰੋਲ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਚੀਜ਼ਾਂ ਹੁੰਦੀਆਂ ਆ ਪਰ ਚਲੋ ਸੋ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਹਰਮਨਿਊਟਿਕਸ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਸਾਧਨਾ ਦਾ ਆਸਪੈਕਟ ਰੱਖਿਆ ਸੋ ਕੱਲੀ ਰੈਸ਼ਨੈਲਿਟੀ ਨਹੀਂ ਰੱਖਿਆ ਸੋ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਕਲੋਨੀਅਲ ਮੀਨਿੰਗ ਨੂੰ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਇੱਕ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਚੈਲੰਜ ਕੀਤਾ ਸੋ ਦੂਜਾ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਹਿਸਟੋਰੀਓਗ੍ਰਾਫੀ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਆਪਣੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਭੂਮਿਕਾ ਲਿਖੀ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਕ੍ਰੀਏਟਿਵ ਹਿਸਟਰੀ ਦਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਪਸਾਰ ਪੈਦਾ ਕੀਤਾ ਉਹ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਇੱਕ ਵੱਡੀ ਕੰਟਰੀਬਿਊਸ਼ਨ ਹੈ ਐਂਡ ਜੀ ਨੋਵਲ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਇਹ ਗੱਲ ਹੈ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਨਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਇਹੀ ਹਿਸਟਰੀ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਜਦੋਂ ਕਨਸੈਪਚੁਅਲ ਲੈਵਲ ਤੇ ਹਿਸਟਰੀ ਬਣਾਈ ਜਾਂਦੀ ਹੈ ਤਾਂ ਟੋਟਲ ਲਾਈਫ ਦੇ ਰਿਦਮ ਉਹਦੇ ਚ ਨਹੀਂ ਆਉਂਦੇ ਨਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਨਾਲ ਉਹ ਕਿਸੇ ਲਾਈਫ ਦੇ ਪੂਰੇ ਰਿਦਮ ਆਉਂਦੇ ਆ ਸੋ ਜੇ ਉਹ ਬ੍ਰਿਟਿਸ਼ਰਸ ਦੁਆਰਾ ਸੈੱਟ ਕੀਤੇ ਨੋਵਲ ਦੇ ਮਾਪਦੰਡਾਂ ਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਨਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਫਿੱਟ ਕੀਤਾ ਜਾਵੇ ਤਾਂ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਨਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਆ ਉਹ ਵੈਸਟਰਨ ਮਾਡਲਸ ਦੇ ਅਧੀਨ ਚਲਾ ਜਾਏਗਾ ਸੋ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਦੀ ਹਿਸਟਰੀ ਵੈਸਟਰਨ ਮਾਡਲਸ ਦੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਕਨਸੈਪਟਸ ਦੇ ਅੰਡਰ ਚੱਲ ਜਾਏਗਾ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਐਪਿਸਟੀਮੋਲੋਜੀਕਲ ਕੰਸਟਰਕਸ਼ਨਸ ਦੇ ਅੰਦਰ ਅਸੀਂ ਇੰਟਰਪ੍ਰੈਟ ਹੋ ਜਾਾਂਗੇ ਤੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਡਾਟਾ ਬਣ ਜਾਵਾਂਗੇ ਸੋ ਜਿਵੇਂ ਕਿ ਲਾਹੌਰ ਦੇ ਬਹੁਤੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ
ਇਹੋ ਜਿਹਾ ਕਰੈਕਟਰ ਪੇਸ਼ ਕਰਨਾ ਕਿ ਜਿਹਦਾ ਜਿਹਨੂੰ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਦੀ ਜਾਂ ਸਿੱਖ ਕੁਲੈਕਟਿਵ ਸਾਈਕ ਨੇ ਆਪਣਾ ਸੇਕਰਡ ਪਲੇਸ ਤੇ ਤੌਰ ਤੇ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਐਕਸੈਪਟ ਕਰ ਲਿਆ ਤੇ ਉਹਦੀ ਥਾਂ ਤੇ ਗੁਰਦੁਆਰਾ ਬਣਾਤਾ ਇਹ ਇਹ ਨਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇਹ ਜਰਨੀ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਦਾ ਕੋਈ ਰਾਈਟਰ ਨਹੀਂ ਪੈਦਾ ਕਰ ਸਕਦਾ ਸੋ ਇਹਦਾ ਮਤਲਬ ਕਿ ਭਾਈ ਵੀਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਨੇ ਇੱਕ ਇਹੋ ਜਿਹਾ ਨਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਬਿਲਡ ਕੀਤਾ ਜਿਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਸਿੱਖ ਤੇ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਦੇ ਅਨੁਭਵ ਦੇ ਅਲੈਦਾ ਅਲੈਦਾ ਮੰਡਲਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਆਪਣੇ ਚ ਸ਼ਾਮਲ ਕਰਕੇ ਅੱਗੇ ਤੋਰਨ ਦੀ ਕਪੈਸਿਟੀ ਪਈ ਹੋਈ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਹੁਣ ਉਸ ਨਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਸਾਹਮਣੇ ਜਦੋਂ ਫੈਮਿਨਿਜ਼ਮ ਨੇ ਜਾਂ ਹਿਸਟੋਰਿਸਿਜ਼ਮ ਚੋਂ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਕੁਐਸਚਨ ਆਏ ਆ ਵੈਸਟ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜੋ ਮਲੋਤਰਾ ਤੇ ਮਤਲਬ ਕਿ ਵੈਸਟਰਨ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਸਕਾਲਰਸ ਆ ਭਾਈ ਵੀਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਦੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਕੰਮ ਕੀਤਾ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਕੁਐਸਚਨ ਵੀ ਰੈਲੇਵੈਂਟ ਹਨ ਕਿ ਉਹ ਇਸ ਨਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਨੂੰ ਹਿਸਟੋਰੀਕਲ ਟਾਈਮ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਅਨਫੋਲਡਿੰਗ ਕਰ ਅਨਫੋਲਡ ਕਰਨ ਦੀ ਮੰਗ ਕਰ ਰਹੇ ਹਨ ਤੇ ਉਹ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਐਡ ਵੀ ਕਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਹਨ ਸੋ ਭਾਵੇਂ ਕਿ ਉਹ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਪੋਜੀਸ਼ਨ ਤੋਂ ਭਾਈ ਵੀਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਦਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਹਾਇਰ ਵਰਡ ਤੇ ਲੋਅਰ ਵਰਡ ਨੂੰ ਇੱਕ ਯੂਨਿਟੀ ਚ ਪੈਦਾ ਕਰਦਾ ਸਪਿਰਚੁਅਲ ਪ੍ਰੋਸੈਸ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਹੈ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਨਿਗੇਟ ਕਰ ਰਹੇ ਹਨ ਪਰ ਉਹ ਉਹਦੇ ਮੀਨਿੰਗ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇੱਕ ਮੰਗ ਪੈਦਾ ਕਰ ਰਹੇ ਹਨ ਸੋ ਉਹ ਮੰਗ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਹੈ ਭਾਈ ਵੀਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਦੇ ਨਾਵਲ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇੱਕ ਏਜ ਦੇ ਮੁਤਾਬਕ ਬਣੇ ਥਾਟ ਪ੍ਰੋਸੈਸ ਤੇ ਉਹਦੀ ਡਿਮਾਂਡ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਪਰਪਕਤਾ ਲਿਆ ਸਕਦੀ ਸੋ ਫਿਰ ਮਤਲਬ ਇਹਨੂੰ ਥੋੜਾ ਜਿਹਾ ਇਹ ਦੋਹਾਂ ਦੇ ਇਸ ਇਕੱਠੇ ਪ੍ਰੋਸੈਸ ਚ ਦੇਖਣ ਦੀ ਵੀ ਲੋੜ ਹੈਗੀ ਆ ਸੋ ਮੈਂ ਜ਼ਿਆਦਾ ਵੀ ਨਾ ਚਲੋ ਬੋਲਾਂ ਸੋ ਮੇਰਾ ਮਤਲਬ ਵੀ ਇਹ ਦੋ ਚੀਜ਼ਾਂ ਇਕੱਠੀਆਂ ਦੇਖਣ ਦੀ ਲੋੜ ਆ ਸੋ ਇਹ ਕੱਲਾ ਅਸੀਂ ਨਾਵਲ ਨੂੰ ਨਹੀਂ ਦੇਖ ਰਹੇ ਇਹਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਅਸੀਂ ਆਪਣਾ ਸਮਾਜ ਵੀ ਦੇਖ ਰਹੇ ਹੋਵਾਂਗੇ ਤੇ ਸਾਡੀ ਆਪਣੀ ਸਪਿਰਚੁਅਲ ਤੇ ਆਪਣੇ ਮਟੀਰੀਅਲ ਬੀਇੰਗ ਦੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਰਿਲਾਈਜੇਸ਼ਨ ਆ ਉਹਦੇ ਬੈਲੈਂਸ ਵੀ ਲੱਭ ਰਹੇ ਹੋਵਾਂਗੇ ਤੇ ਉਹ ਟਾਈਮ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਕਿਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਬਲੌਸਮ ਕਰਦਾ ਆ ਆਪਣੀਆਂ ਕੰਟਰਡਿਕਸ਼ਨਸ ਦੇ ਸਮੇਤ ਆਪਣੀਆਂ ਲਿਮਿਟੇਸ਼ਨਸ ਦੇ ਸਮੇਤ ਤੇ ਕਾਲ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਦੱਥ ਦੇ ਰੂਪ ਫਿਰਦੇ ਆ ਸਾਡੀ ਚੇਤਨਾ ਦੇ ਦੁਆਲੇ ਉਹਦੀ ਟੁੱਟ ਭੱਜ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਅਨੁਭਵ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਹੁੰਦੀ ਹੈ ਤੇ ਲੈਂਗੁਏਜ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਤੇ ਕਨਸੈਪਟਸ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਹੁੰਦੀ ਹੈ ਉਹਦੀ ਡਿਵਿਨਿਟੀ ਨੂੰ ਰਿਲਾਈਜ਼ ਕਰਾਂਗੇ ਸੋ ਮੈਂ ਕਹਿ ਰਿਹਾ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਆਪਣੇ ਅਧੂਰੇਪਣ ਦੀ ਡਿਵਿਨਿਟੀ ਨੂੰ ਵੀ ਰਿਲਾਈਜ਼ ਕਰਾਂਗੇ ਸੋ ਇਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਇਸ ਨਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਆ ਭਾਈ ਵੀਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਦਾ ਇਸ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਅਦ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਨਾਵਲ ਆ ਮੈਂ ਬਹੁਤਾ ਟਾਈਮ ਨਹੀਂ ਲੈਂਦਾ ਸੋ ਇਸ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਅਦ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਨਾਨਕ ਸਿੰਘ ਦੇ ਨਾਵਲ ਆ ਕਮਲ ਦੇ ਨਾਵਲ ਆ ਜਾਂ ਗੁਰਦਿਆਲ ਸਿੰਘ ਦੇ ਇਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਨਾਵਲ ਆ ਉਹ ਐਡੇ ਵੱਡੇ ਪਸਾਰ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਆਪਣੇ ਕੈਰੈਕਟਰ ਨੂੰ ਨਹੀਂ ਲਿਜਾ ਸਕੇ ਸੋ ਇਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਪੈਰਾਡਾਈਮ ਕੰਮ ਕਰ ਰਿਹਾ ਐਕਸਪੀਰੀਅੰਸ ਦਾ ਉਹ ਬਹੁਤ ਵੱਡਾ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਇਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਇਹ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਟੱਚ ਕਰਦਾ ਹੈ ਤੇ ਸਕਾਲਰਸ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਉਹ ਆਪਣੀ ਇੱਕ ਆਈਡੀਓਲੋਜੀਕਲ ਕੰਸਟਰਕਸ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚੋਂ ਉਹ ਆਪਣੀ ਕੰਟਰੀਬਿਊਸ਼ਨ ਦੇਣਾ ਚਾਹੁੰਦੇ ਆ ਭਾਵੇਂ ਕਿ ਉਹ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਰਿਜੈਕਸ਼ਨ ਦੀ ਪੋਜੀਸ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਦੋਂ ਉਹ ਆਪਣੇ ਆਪਣੀ ਪੋਜੀਸ਼ਨ ਦਾ ਹੋਲ ਬਣਾਉਂਦੇ ਆ ਜਾਂ ਐਬਸੋਲਿਊਟ ਬਣਾਉਂਦੇ ਆ ਤਾਂ ਉਦੋਂ ਉਹ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਰਿਜੈਕਸ਼ਨ ਦੀ ਪੋਜੀਸ਼ਨ ਚ ਲਿਆਉਂਦੇ ਆ ਪਰ ਉਹ ਜੋ ਉਹ ਅੰਸ਼ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਆ ਜਿਹਦੇ ਜਿਹਨੂੰ ਕ੍ਰੀਏਟਿਵਲੀ ਤੇ ਆਈਡੀਓਲੋਜੀਕਲੀ ਪੋਜ਼ਿਟਿਵ ਸੋਸ਼ਲ ਥਾਟ ਦੀ ਪੋਜ਼ਿਟਿਵਿਟੀ ਜੋ ਐਂਟਰ ਕਰਾਉਣਾ ਚਾਹੁੰਦੇ ਆ ਉਹ ਆਪਣੇ ਆਪ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇੱਕ ਰੈਲੇਵੈਂਟ ਪੋਜੀਸ਼ਨ ਆ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਭਾਈ ਵੀਰ ਸਿੰਘ
ਜਿਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਅਕਲ ਦੀਆਂ ਸਮਾਜ ਦੀਆਂ ਸਮੇਂ ਦੀਆਂ ਤਰਕੀਬਾਂ ਹੋਰ ਸਾਰੀਆਂ ਚੀਜ਼ਾਂ ਬੜੇ ਇੰਟੈਂਸੀਫਾਈਡ ਰੂਪ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਯੂਨਾਈਟ ਕਰ ਜਾਂਦੀਆਂ ਆ ਤਤਰ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਸਭ ਨੂੰ ਵੱਡਾ ਲਫ਼ਜ਼ ਬਣਦਾ ਆ ਉਹ ਧਨ ਲਫ਼ਜ਼ ਬਣਦਾ ਜਾਂ ਨਿਹਾਲ 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 ਬਣਦਾ ਸੋ ਇਹ ਸਾਡੀ ਟ੍ਰੈਡੀਸ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਸ਼ਾਮਲ ਹੋਇਆ ਇਸ ਰਾਈਟਿੰਗ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇਹ ਲਫ਼ਜ਼ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਆ ਸੁੰਦਰੀ ਦੇ ਸਾਹਮਣੇ ਪੇਸ਼ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਆ ਇੱਕ ਨਿਹੰਗ ਸਿੰਘ ਟ੍ਰੈਡੀਸ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚੋਂ ਤੇ ਉਹ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਕਈ ਵਾਰੀ ਦੇਵੀ ਦੁਰਗਾ ਮਾਤਾ ਸਹਿਬ ਦੇ ਵਾਨੀ ਪੁੱਤਰੀ ਪਾ ਕਾਸਮਿਕ ਮਦਰ ਪ੍ਰਿੰਸੀਪਲ ਦੀ ਨੇੜਤਾ ਚ ਲਿਆਉਂਦਾ ਆ ਉਹਦਾ ਉਹਦਾ ਵੰਡਰ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਸੋ ਇਹ ਨੁਕਤਾ ਵੀ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਥੋੜਾ ਦੇਖਣਾ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਆ ਟੈਕਸਟ ਦੀਆਂ ਬਹੁਤ ਸਾਰੀਆਂ ਵੇਰੀਏਸ਼ਨਸ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਅੰਦਰ ਪਈਆਂ ਹੋਈਆਂ ਮੈਂ ਤਾਂ ਲਿਖੀਆਂ ਦੀ ਆ ਪਰ ਟਾਈਮ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੈ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਡੈਡੇ ਦੀ ਅੰਦਰਲੀ ਹਰਕਤ ਦੇ ਨੇੜੇ ਰਹਿ ਕੇ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਜੀਣਾ ਫਿਰ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਕਿਸੇ ਫਰੇਮ ਚ ਲਿਆਉਣਾ ਇਹ ਬਹੁਤ ਜ਼ਰੂਰੀ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਕਈ ਵਾਰੀ ਅਸੀਂ ਜਦੋਂ ਆਈਡੀਓਲੋਜੀ ਤੋਂ ਪੋਜੀਸ਼ਨ ਲਈ ਹੁੰਦੀ ਆ ਤਾਂ ਅਸੀਂ ਡੈਟੇ ਦੇ ਅੰਦਰਲੀ ਤਰਲਤਾ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਹੈ ਉਹਦੇ ਅੰਦਰਲੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਵਹਿਣ ਆ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਨਹੀਂ ਦੇਖਦੇ ਤੇ ਉਹਦੇ ਕਰਕੇ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਅਸੀਂ ਟੈਕਸਟ ਨਾਲ ਪੂਰਾ ਨਿਆਂ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਸੋ ਚਲੋ ਮੈਂ ਹੁਣ ਆਖਰ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਚਲੋ ਇੱਕ ਹੋਰ ਦੱਸਦੇ ਇਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਦੇਖੋ ਕਿਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਦਾ ਸੀਨ ਹੈ ਇਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇਹ ਪੂਰਨ ਸਿੰਘ ਦੀ ਪੋਇਟਰੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਇੰਗਲਿਸ਼ ਦੀ ਟੈਂਪਲ ਟੂਲਸ ਆ ਜੇ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਉਹ ਪੜ੍ਹੀ ਹੋਵੇ ਤਾਂ ਉਹ ਸੁੰਦਰੀ ਦੇ ਵੱਖ-ਵੱਖ ਸੀਨਸ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਆ ਉਹਨੇ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚੋਂ ਇਨਸਪਾਇਰ ਹੋ ਕੇ ਪੋਇਟਰੀ ਲਿਖੀ ਆ ਉਹ ਪੈਰਲਲ ਲੱਭੇ ਜਾ ਸਕਦੇ ਆ ਇਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਉਹ ਚੀਜ਼ਾਂ ਵੀ ਪਈਆਂ ਹੋਈਆਂ ਆ ਜਿਵੇਂ ਟੈਂਪਲ ਟੂਲਸ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਸਿੱਖ ਮਦਰ ਯੂ ਨੋ ਨਾਟ ਉਹ ਬਿਲਕੁਲ ਹੂਬ ਹੂ ਇਹਦੇ ਤੋਂ ਸਿੱਧੀ ਇਨਸਪਾਇਰ ਆ ਐਂਜ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇੱਕ ਤੇ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਕਿ ਜਦੋਂ ਫੌਜ ਚੜਦੀ ਆ ਤਾਂ ਚੜਾਈ ਦਾ ਸ਼ਬਦ ਸੁਣ ਕੇ ਖਾਲਸੇ ਦੀ ਫੌਜ ਬਸੰਤ ਰੁੱਤ ਦੀ ਪੌਣ ਵਾਂਗ ਸੱਜੇ ਸੱਜੇ ਤੁਰ ਪਈ ਇਹ ਦ੍ਰਿਸ਼ ਇੰਨਾ ਬਿਊਟੀਫੁਲ ਆ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਇਹ ਤੋਂ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਬਹੁਤ ਕਮਸਾਨ ਦੀ ਟੈਰੀਬਲ ਜੰਗ ਹੋ ਰਹੀ ਹੈ ਜਿਹਦੇ ਸਥਿਤੀ ਬਹੁਤ ਤਣਾਅ ਵਾਲੀ ਆ ਸੋ ਇਹਦੇ ਚ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਇਹ ਦੋ ਚੀਜ਼ਾਂ ਇਕੱਠੀਆਂ ਚੱਲਦੀਆਂ ਇਹਦੇ ਨਾਵਲ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਕਿ ਬੇਹੱਦ ਤਣਾਅ ਬੇਹੱਦ ਸਹਿਜ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਇਹ ਡੁਐਲਿਟੀਜ਼ ਆ ਹਿਊਮਨ ਡੁਐਲਿਟੀਜ਼ ਆ ਇਹਨੂੰ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਉਹ ਟਾਈਮਲੈਸਨੈਸ ਤੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਐਕਸਪੀਰੀਅੰਸ ਸੁੰਦਰੀ ਚ ਪਏ ਆ ਜਾਂ ਸਿੱਖ ਅਨੁਭਵ ਚ ਪਏ ਆ ਉਹ ਬੈਸਟੋ ਕਰਦਾ ਵਕਵਕ ਘਟਨਾਵਾਂ ਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਭਾਈ ਵੀਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਸੋ ਇਹ ਨੁਕਤੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਬਹੁਤ ਚੰਗੇ ਆ ਇਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਦੀਆਂ ਚੀਜ਼ਾਂ ਉਸ ਵੇਲੇ ਇਕਬਾਲ ਨੇ ਵੀ ਲਿਖੀਆਂ ਹੋਈਆਂ ਤਕਰੀਬਨ ਇਕਬਾਲ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਵੀ ਇਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਸੋ ਮੇਰੇ ਮਤਲਬ ਉਹ ਬਹੁਤ ਪੋਇਟਿਕ ਹੈ ਉਹਦਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਇਹ ਪਸਾਰ ਆ ਸੋ ਇਹ ਚੀਜ਼ਾਂ ਦੇਖਣੀ ਚਾਹੀਦੀਆਂ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਸੋ ਇੱਕ ਮੈਂ ਹੋਰ ਚੀਜ਼ ਕਹਿਣੀ ਚਾਹੁੰਦਾ ਕਿ ਇਸ ਭੂਮਿਕਾ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਕਿ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਇਹ ਦੋ ਪੋਜੀਸ਼ਨਸ ਬਣੀਆਂ ਜਿਨ੍ਹਾਂ ਦਾ ਡਾਇਲੈਕਟ ਕਰਾਇਆ ਇਸ ਭੂਮਣਾ ਭੂਮਕਾ ਨੇ ਤੇ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਰੀਕੰਟੈਕਸ਼ੁਅਲਾਈਜ਼ ਕਰਨ ਦੀ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਕੀਤੀ ਹੈ ਪਰ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਅੰਦਰਲਾ ਪੈਰਾਡਾਈਮ ਬਾਰੇ ਮੈਂ ਗੱਲ ਕਰਨੀ ਚਾਹੁੰਦਾ ਹਾਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਪੈਰਾਡਾਈਮ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਆ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਸਿੱਖ ਵਿਸ਼ਵਾਸ ਵਾਲੇ ਲੋਕ ਹਨ ਉਹ ਵੀ ਆਪਣੇ ਡੈਟੇ ਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਫੇਥ ਕਰਦੇ ਹਨ ਸੋ ਉਹਦੀ ਮਟੀਰੀਅਲਿਟੀ ਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਫੇਥ ਕਰਦੇ ਹਨ ਉਹਦੇ ਚੋ ਸਪਿਰਚੁਅਲਿਟੀ ਪੈਦਾ ਕਰਦੇ ਹੋਏ ਹਿਸਟਰੀ ਚ ਉਤਰਦੇ ਹਨ ਸੋ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਪੋਜੀਸ਼ਨਸ ਤੋਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਰਿਜੈਕਟ ਕਰਨ ਦੀ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਕੀਤੀ ਗਈ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਵੀ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਉਸੇ 
ਕਿ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਸਾਡੇ ਨਾਲ ਸਹਿਯੋਗ ਕਰਕੇ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਇਸ ਸਥਾਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਹਰ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਦੀ ਸਹੂਲਤ ਦਿੱਤੀ ਤੇ ਇੱਕ ਮੌਕਾ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਆਪਣੀ ਰਵਾਇਤ ਦੇ ਇਸ ਵੱਡੇ ਟੈਕਸਟ ਰਾਹੀਂ ਜਿਹਦੇ ਰਾਹੀਂ ਅਸੀਂ ਇਸ ਮੁਕਾਮ ਤੇ ਖੜੇ ਹਾਂ ਕਿ ਨਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਤੇ ਸ਼ਬਦ ਫਿਲਾਸਫੀ ਦੇ ਰਿਲੇਸ਼ਨ ਲੱਭੇ ਜਾਣ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਨਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਤੋਂ ਬਿਨਾਂ ਹਿਸਟਰੀ ਚ ਨਹੀਂ ਆਇਆ ਜਾ ਸਕਦਾ ਸੋ ਨਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਦਾ ਸਾਥੀ ਨਹੀਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਕੀ ਰਿਲੇਸ਼ਨ ਬਣਦਾ ਉਹਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਥੋੜਾ ਧਿਆਨ ਦਿੰਦੇ ਹੋਏ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਪਸਾਰਾਂ ਚ ਕੰਮ ਕਰਨਾ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਸੋ ਅਸੀਂ ਮਡੇਰ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਦਾ ਤੇ ਯੂਨੀਵਰਸਿਟੀ ਆਫ ਮਿਸ਼ੀਗਨ ਏਸ਼ੀਅਨ ਲੈਂਗੁਏਜਸ ਡਿਪਾਰਟਮੈਂਟ ਦਾ ਬਹੁਤ ਧੰਵਾਦੀ ਹਾਂ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਕੋਮਲ ਡਾਂਗ ਜੀ ਕੋਮਲ ਕੌਰ ਡਾਂਗ ਜੀ ਅਤੇ ਸਤਪਾਲ ਡਾਂਗ ਜੀ ਸਾਡੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਸ਼ਾਮਲ ਹੋਏ ਹਨ ਇਹ ਭਾਈ ਵੀਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਜੀ ਦੀ ਫੈਮਿਲੀ ਨੂੰ ਬਿਲੋਂਗ ਕਰਦੇ ਹਨ ਸੋ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਬੜੀ ਮਿਹਰ ਕੀਤੀ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਯਾਦ ਦੇ ਸਮੇਤ ਤੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀਆਂ ਪਰਿਵਾਰਕ ਚੀਜ਼ਾਂ ਦੇ ਸਮੇਤ ਸਾਡੇ ਚ ਹਾਜ਼ਰ ਹੋਏ ਹਨ ਤੇ ਇਸ ਪ੍ਰੋਗਰਾਮ ਨੂੰ ਬਿਹਤਰ ਬਣਾਉਣ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਆਪਣੀ ਪ੍ਰੈਜ਼ੈਂਸ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਹੈ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਦਿੱਤੀ ਹੈ ਨਿਲੰਬਰੀ ਕੇ ਜੀ ਦਾ ਮੈਂ ਬਹੁਤ ਹੈ ਦਿਨੋਂ ਤਰਵਾਦੀ ਹਾਂ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਅਸੀਂ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਵੀ ਅੰਮ੍ਰਿਤਸਰ ਚ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਅਸੀਂ ਛੜਿਆ ਬਰਸੰਤ ਫੈਸਟੀਵਲ ਕਰਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਉਹਦੇ ਚ ਬੁਲਾਇਆ ਸੀ ਇਹ ਉੱਥੇ ਵੀ ਆਏ ਸੀਗੇ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਰਾਹੀਂ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਭਾਈ ਵੀਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਪ੍ਰੋਫੈਸਰ ਪੂਰਨ ਸਿੰਘ ਦੀਆਂ ਰਾਈਟਿੰਗਸ ਨੂੰ ਪੜਨ ਦਾ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਐਡਿਟ ਕਰਨ ਦਾ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਸਹਿਯੋਗ ਨਾਲ ਬਹੁਤ ਹੌਸਲਾ ਮਿਲਿਆ ਆ ਤੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਉਹ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਚੀਜ਼ਾਂ ਅਜੇ ਤੱਕ ਨਹੀਂ ਸੀ ਜ਼ਾਹਰ ਹੋਈਆਂ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਪੂਰੀ ਤਨਦੇਹੀ ਨਾਲ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਸਹਿਯੋਗ ਨਾਲ ਤੇ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਗਾਈਡੈਂਸ ਨਾਲ ਅਸੀਂ ਐਡਿਟ ਕਰਕੇ ਛਾਪ ਰਹੇ ਹਾਂ ਤੇ ਅੱਗੇ ਵੀ ਅਸੀਂ ਇਸ ਦਿਸ਼ਾ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਕੰਮ ਕਰਾਂਗੇ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਚੀਜ਼ਾਂ ਅਜੇ ਨਹੀਂ ਸਾਹਮਣੇ ਆ ਸਕੀਆਂ ਅਸੀਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਵੀ ਪੇਸ਼ ਕਰਨ ਦੀ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਕਰ ਰਹੇ ਹਾਂ ਤੇ ਉਹਦਾ ਇੱਕ ਮਿਆਰੀ ਰੂਪ ਹੋਵੇ ਤੇ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਪੂਰਾ ਇੱਕ ਠੀਕ ਪਰਸਪੈਕਟਿਵ ਪੇਸ਼ ਹੋਵੇ ਇਸ ਚੀਜ਼ ਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਵੀ ਅਸੀਂ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਕਰ ਰਹੇ ਹਾਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਵੀ ਬਹੁਤ ਤਹਿ ਦਿਲੋਂ ਧੰਨਵਾਦ ਆ ਤੇ ਮੈਂ ਉਮੀਦ ਕਰਦਾ ਵੀ ਅੱਗੇ ਤੋਂ ਵੀ ਉਹ ਆਪਣਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਇੱਕ ਬਜ਼ੁਰਗਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਅਸ਼ੀਰਵਾਦ ਸਾਡੇ ਨਾਲ ਰੱਖਣਗੇ ਤੇ ਮੈਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਵੀ ਤਹਿ ਦਿਲੋਂ ਧੰਨਵਾਦੀ ਹਾਂ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਪ੍ਰਵਿੰਦਰ ਮਹਿਤਾ ਜੀ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਹਰਲੀਨ ਕੌਰ ਅਤੇ ਗੁਰਪ੍ਰੀਤ ਕੌਰ ਜਿਨ੍ਹਾਂ ਨੇ ਅੱਜ ਪੇਪਰ ਪੜੇ ਹਨ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਵੀ ਬਹੁਤ ਤਹਿ ਦਿਲੋਂ ਧੰਨਵਾਦ ਹੈ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਇਹ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਸਕਾਲਰਸ਼ਿਪ ਦਾ ਕੰਮ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਜਾਂ ਕਿਸੇ ਚੀਜ਼ ਨੂੰ ਸਮਝਣ ਸਮਝਾਉਣ ਦਾ ਕੰਮ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਇਹ ਰਲ ਕੇ ਹੀ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਹੈ ਇਹਦੇ ਚ ਕੋਈ ਇੱਕ ਵਿਅਕਤੀ ਠੀਕ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਵਿਅਕਤੀ ਲੀਡ ਕਰਦਾ ਹੈ ਪਰ ਇੱਕ ਸਾਂਝਾ ਐਫਰਟ ਹੈ ਸਾਡੇ ਇਹਦੇ ਬਾਰੇ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਝੁਕਾਇਆ ਕਿ ਸੰਗਤੀ ਰੂਪ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਹੀ ਖੋਜ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਠੀਕ ਸਿਰੇ ਲੱਗ ਸਕਦੀ ਹੈ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਇੱਕ ਦੂਜੇ ਦੀ ਲੋੜ ਸਹਿਯੋਗ ਇੱਕ ਦੂਜੇ ਦਾ ਉਤਸ਼ਾਹ ਜਿਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਜ਼ਿੰਦਗੀ ਦੇ ਪਚੀਦਾ ਮਾਹੌਲ ਬਣੇ ਆ ਸਾਰੇ ਬਿਜ਼ੀ ਹੁੰਦੇ ਆ ਉਹਦੇ ਚ ਇੱਕ ਦੂਜੇ ਨੂੰ ਦੇਖ ਕੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਅੱਗੇ ਵੱਧਦੇ ਆ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਮਨੁੱਖ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਆਪਣੀਆਂ ਅਸਮਰਥਾਵਾਂ ਦਾ ਬੋਝ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਉਹ ਆਪ ਨਹੀਂ ਚੱਕ ਸਕਦਾ ਉਹ ਆਪਣੀਆਂ ਸੀਮਾਵਾਂ ਦੇ ਬੋਝ ਥੱਲੇ ਆ ਸੋ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਇੱਕ ਦੂਜੇ ਦੀ ਪ੍ਰੇਰਣਾ ਦੀ ਬਹੁਤ ਲੋੜ ਆ ਅਸੀਂ ਉਮੀਦ ਕਰਦੇ ਆ ਕਿ ਅੱਗੇ ਤੋਂ ਵੀ ਇਹ ਸਾਥ ਦੇਣਗੇ ਤੇ ਆਪਣੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਗਾਈਡੈਂਸ ਆ ਉਹ ਰੱਖਣਗੇ ਤੇ ਤਾਂ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਹੋਰ ਚੰਗਾ ਕੰਮ ਕਰ ਸਕੀਏ ਤੇ ਹੋਰ ਐਫੀਸ਼ੀਐਂਟਲੀ ਇੱਥੇ ਸੰਗਤ ਦੀ ਸੇਵਾ ਕਰ ਸਕੀਏ
ਸੋ ਇਹਨੂੰ ਨਾਮ ਰਸ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਆ ਸੋ ਇਸ ਸੰਗਤ ਦੀ ਪ੍ਰਾਈਮੇਸੀ ਆ ਇਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਕੋਈ ਇਹਦੇ ਚ ਐਥੀਕਲ ਲੈਵਲ ਦਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਅਸੀਂ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਨਮਾਣਾ ਬਣ ਉਹ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੈ ਇਹ ਇੱਕ ਜਿਵੇਂ ਦਰਖਤ ਨੂੰ ਫਲ ਲੱਗ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਤੇ ਉਹ ਨੀਵਾ ਹੋ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਇਹ ਗੌਰੇ ਹੋਣ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਆ ਗੌਰਾ ਉਹ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਭਰਪੂਰ ਹੋਵੇ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਆਕਾਸ਼ ਦੇ ਫਲ ਨਾਲ ਲੱਦਿਆ ਜਾਵੇ ਧਰਤੀ ਦਾ ਦਰਖਤ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਗੌਰਾ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਆ ਸੋ ਸਕਾਲਰਸ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਆ ਉਹ ਸੰਗਤ ਦੇ ਨਾਮ ਰਸੀ ਪ੍ਰਭਾਵ ਦੀ ਛਾਂ ਥੱਲੇ ਹੁੰਦੇ ਆ ਸੋ ਸੰਗਤ ਇੱਥੇ ਹਾਜ਼ਰ ਹੋਈ ਹੈ ਮੈਂ ਉਮੀਦ ਕਰਦਾ ਹਾਂ ਕਿ ਅਗਲੇ ਫੰਕਸ਼ਨਸ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਵੀ ਉਹ ਹਾਜ਼ਰੀ ਭਰਿਆ ਕਰਨ ਤਾਂ ਕਿ ਇਹ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਦਵੱਲੀ ਇੱਕ ਪ੍ਰਕਿਰਿਆ ਆ ਇਹਨੂੰ ਅਸੀਂ ਅੱਗੇ ਵਧਾ ਸਕੀਏ ਤੇ ਉਮੀਦ ਕਰ ਸਕੀਏ ਕਿ ਧਰਤੀ ਤੇ ਸਿੱਖ ਪੰਥ ਦੀਆਂ ਆਪਣੀਆਂ ਨੇੜੇ ਨੇੜਤਾ ਚ ਰਹਿੰਦੀਆਂ ਹੋਈਆਂ ਰਿਲਾਈਜੇਸ਼ਨ ਰਾਹੀਂ ਅਸੀਂ ਸ਼ਬਦ ਸਭਤਾ ਦਾ ਨਿਰਮਾਣ ਕਰ ਸਕੀਏ ਜਿਹਦੇ ਚ ਵਿਸ਼ਵ ਦੇ ਸਾਰੇ ਪਸਾਰਾਂ ਦੇ ਪ੍ਰਤੀ ਅਸੀਂ ਓਪਨ ਰਹੀਏ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਨਾਮ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਇਹ ਵਿਸ਼ਵ ਵਿਆਪੀ ਚੀਜ਼ ਆ ਇਹ ਇਹ ਕੋਈ ਹਿਸਟਰੀ ਦੁਆਰਾ ਕੰਡੀਸ਼ਨਡ ਫੇਥ ਤੇ ਉਹਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਜੁੜੇ ਕਿਸੇ ਹਿਸਟਰੀ ਨੂੰ ਬਿਲੋਂਗ ਕਰਦੇ ਪੀਪਲ ਦੀ ਖੇਡ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੈ ਕੱਲੇ ਇਹ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਨੇੜਤਾ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਹੈ ਪਰ ਇਹਦਾ ਪਸਾਰ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਆ ਉਹ ਬ੍ਰਹਮੰਡੀ ਹੈ ਇਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਇਹ ਸੰਗਤ ਇਹਦਾ ਸਾਥ ਦੇਵੇ ਤੇ ਸ਼ਬਦ ਸਿਵਲਾਈਜੇਸ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਪਸਾਰ ਹਨ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਬਾਰੇ ਕੋਈ ਧਿਆਨੀ ਇੱਕ ਸੁਰਤਾ ਪੈਦਾ ਕੀਤੀ ਜਾ ਸਕੇ ਮੈਂ ਜਿਆਦਾ ਬੋਲ ਗਿਆ ਹਾਂ ਤਾਂ ਥੋੜਾ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਨਜ਼ਰ ਅੰਦਾਜ਼ ਕਰਨਾ ਤੇ ਇਹ ਪ੍ਰੋਗਰਾਮ ਨੇ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਖੁਸ਼ੀ ਦਿੱਤੀ ਹੈ ਤੇ ਆਪ ਸਭ